Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The board has already participated in two closed risk management sessions. I now call the meeting of the school board of Palm Beach County to order. This is October 20, 2021 at 5 p.m. Mrs. Bass, please call the roll. District 1, Barbara McQuinn. Here. District 2, Alexandria Ayala. Here. District 3, Karen Brill. Here. District 4, Erica Whitfield. Here. District 5, Frank Barbieri. Here. District 6, Marcia Andrews. Here. District 7, Deborah Robinson. Here. We have quorum with all seven board members present. Also joining us is Superintendent Michael Burke, General Counsel Sean Bernard, Inspector General Teresa Michael, Board Clerk Carol Bass, Board Executive Assistant Tony Lynn Bellotta, and Council, uh, County Council of Student Councils President Logan Harrigan. Senior staff members will join us periodically as directed by the superintendent. Viewers and listeners can access the meeting today by either watching on Comcast channels 234 and 235 UVerse channel 99 or by using the YouTube link on our webpage at palmbeachschools.org. In the event that the link is interrupted for technical reasons, please switch over to the TV channels. All board meetings are recorded in their entirety and posted on the district website within 24 hours. We also offer a listening only option which the public can access by calling 561-357-5900 or toll free at 1-866-930-7015. The meeting ID is 1561-880-1124, pound sign. This meeting is being transcribed by a closed captioner, so please remember to speak at a reasonable pace. Will everyone please stand for the pledge to be led by Superintendent Michael Burke. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Go, School Board of Palm Beach County supports the peaceful assembly of persons to express themselves regarding matters concerning district students, employees, and the community. We warn you, however, that if actions of any members of the public result in a disturbance, those persons are subject to arrest or other lawful action. Consequently, we urge you to be respectful of all persons who are present on school district property. While you are in attendance here at the board meeting, keep in mind the important safety protocols that the board has in place to conform to COVID-19 safety guide guidelines and the school board policies, which I will re review with you now. In an effort to keep all participants and district employees safe, everyone must obey all lawful orders issued by school police, which may include remaining in or moving to a specific area or location, lowering voices for safety reasons or other safety related commands. School police have the seating arranged based on security protocols developed by school police. Once you are seated, you are required to remain seated unless you are going to the podium, to the restroom, or are leaving the meeting. If you move your chairs or get out of your seats, school police will enforce those security protocols and has authority to have you removed from the meeting if those security pro protocols are breached. Maintain social distancing at all times, remain in the designated areas, and leave the property once your visit is complete. While you are in this boardroom, you must wear a mask that covers both your mouth and nose at all times. School police have the authority to remove any person who violates this directive without further direction from the chair. Public comments must relate to the subject matter for which the speaker has requested to address the board. Pursuant to school board policy 1.03 and 2.065, speakers whose comments do not relate to the topic that the speaker indicated including but not limited to personal insults directed at board members, the superintendent or district staff, or the mention of any person's candidacy for elected office are subject to having the microphone turned off and forfeiting the right to speak for the remainder of today's meetings. This board has sat here courteously listening with civility to public speakers, despite many of the speakers acting to the contrary and being discourteous to the board and district staff. This board will not tolerate this kind of behavior. Public speakers must be orderly, behave with civility, refrain from obscene or vulgar conduct, and for, refrain from using profanity or making statements that tend to incite violence or breach of the peace. No person attending this meeting is to harass any other person in the room. Loud or prolonged applause, cheering, heckling, or jeering is disruptive to the meeting and for those attempting to speak and may result in your removal from the meeting. Please respect these cautionary warnings. Failure to follow the safety protocols and procedures as I have outlined or otherwise disruptive conduct is considered interfering with the expeditious or orderly process of the board meeting 
and will be considered grounds for removal from the meeting by school police. We will maintain decorum, civility, and the orderly conduct of school board business today. Thank you. Board members, we need a motion to approve the minutes that are on the agenda. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, second by Mrs. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. We have one item that's been added for good cause. Actually, we have two items. LR1, MOU with Association of Education Secretaries and Office Personnel. Good cause exists to add this item in order to compensate our employees in the ASOP bargaining unit in a timely manner. And LR2, MOU with Service Employees International Union, Florida Public Services Union. Good cause exists to add this item in order to compensate our employees in the SEIU, FPSU, Regular Supervisor Repair Professional 2, and Early Childhood Professionals Bargaining Unit in a timely manner. P2, personnel addendum. Good cause exists to add this item so employees can begin in their new positions as soon as possible. Mr. Superintendent, do you have any items to withdraw? Yes, I'd like to withdraw FC2. All right. Board members, you wish to pull anything from the agenda at this time? We need a motion to approve the agenda. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Vice Chairwoman Brill. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Mr. Superintendent, you have comments? Yes, sir. Uh, as the board well knows, one of the challenges with the pandemic has been staffing enough substitute teachers. Uh, so this past Saturday, we held a hiring event to try to make that onboarding process as easy as possible. Uh, we had a pretty good turnout, and you'll continue to see events like that uh, as we work to, to get staffed up. One of our more immediate measures to, to try to pitch in and help out our schools was on Monday, we sent out a large group of district office employees, uh, those that had been teachers in the past to go pitch in as a day-to-day -day substitute, and that's gonna continue on Mondays and Fridays. Mondays and Fridays are our most difficult day to find substitutes, we, that's when we tend to have the most absences. And uh, I got to be part of the action on Monday. I had the pleasure of substituting at Forest Hill Elementary School. I just wanted to uh, thank Dr. McNichol. Well, it's Mr. McNichol, probably soon to be a doctor. But Mr. McNichol uh, has a, a, done a great job there. The, the climate and the culture at the school was just terrific. Uh, I was so impressed with the, the faculty and the students. I got a chance to uh, teach fourth grade math for the day. And uh, I'll just disclose, I was very fortunate to have a math resource teacher that pushed into my room and uh, taught me how to teach division in the, in the current era. Uh, my, my methods have, uh, were dated and there's a whole new uh, methodology to that, but uh, the kids hung in there with me and by the end of the day, uh, I felt pretty good about what we were doing. So anyway, that was a great experience. Uh, we're going to continue doing that, and then hopefully as we staff up, it'll become less necessary to, uh, to redirect our personnel. Uh, last Friday, we had our 22nd annual technology conference. It was virtual. I'd like to recognize uh, Dr. Adam Miller, Dr. Sheffield, the whole ed technology team. Our IT team got involved in that. And this conference, you know, as we look back, uh, the theme was, you know, fast forward uh, 10 years of growth basically in one year that was kind of forced upon us with the pandemic. And as we kind of reflected on it, you know, that, that conference has always been kind of the launching pad of new innovation and technology. That's, that's what brought us to Trailblazers, where we had teachers that were first to, uh, to get trained on it and, you know, roll out the Chromebooks. It brought us to interactive flat panels. And all that technology has paid huge dividends as we had to quickly shift to online learning. And uh, the attendance was great. We had over 1,300 people. Uh, some educators from actually other countries around the globe uh, zooming in. Uh, so that, that was terrific, and I was proud to be part of that. On October 26th, we've got a big event with our annual showcase of schools. It's once again, it's going to be virtual just for everyone's safety, but we have over 330 career and choice programs from K to 12, and uh, I really encourage our families as they get ready to go through this process, if they're looking to exercise their choice, to take advantage of that event. It's a great opportunity to learn more about our programs and our offerings. And we're going to do a Facebook Live to kind of kick that off on the 26th. And then lastly, as an FSU alum, I feel obligated to explain my attire here today. Uh, orange is not part of my normal color wheel, but this is a special day. It is Unity Day. And Unity Day is to show unity, kindness, acceptance, and inclusion to send a visible message that no child should ever experience bullying. So I've, I've broken my normal rule of wearing garnet and gold. 
and I'm proudly wearing orange today in, in support of this important day. And with that, Chairman, that concludes my comments. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Board comments, Ms. McQuinn? Just very quickly, I had the opportunity since we last met to be in some schools. Uh, one, I visited some academy programs and another, I got to ride in a golf cart with Mr. Burke at a homecoming parade. I think he had not seen a homecoming parade since he was in high school and it was so much fun. And the other that was really, oh, I know, it was a thank a teacher at Alamanda Elementary School. It reminded me when I saw the kids engaged in their learning or in the case of the homecoming parade, having fun and having such good interaction in the academies with their teacher, it reminded me that they aren't that much concerned with our adult issues. They're just going to school and learning and having a good time. So I enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Quinn. Ms. Ayala. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I first want to start by recognizing and thanking all of the um, schools in our district for in having some incredible celebrations and events for Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, there were some really cool things going on all over the place, but I had the chance to participate with Forest Hill Elementary, with Howell Watkins Middle, with Palm Springs Middle. I want to say thank you for inviting me to share in these experiences and give the students an opportunity to learn about the contributions of Hispanic and Latin Americans and also to understand the importance of diversity in our cultures. Secondly, I'd like to congratulate our very own Patricia Trejo, an administrative program planner of our Hispanic and Latino studies with the Department of Teaching and Learning. She was just awarded the 2021 ALAS, or Association of Latino Administrators and Superintendents Continuing Education Scholarship. Professional development is such a huge priority for all of us here to ensure that our employees have opportunities to continue in their careers with us. And I can't wait to see the next steps of her career and support her. And finally, I want to um, let you all know that one of our great district partners, the Norton Museum, is going to be uh, having a collection on display for Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera's works called Mexican Modernism. So I encourage you to go and take an opportunity, if you can, to see the works and share in that important uh, contribution to our community and really take in the art because it's so important for students to understand what their capabilities are and enjoy that. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ayala. Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to take the time in my comments to talk about our superintendent really briefly, uh, mostly to respond to an email that we received um, talking about how we are no longer going through the superintendent search process. Um, this is something that I feel very passionate about. I love having community input. I think it's a very important part of our um, democracy, of, of our school system. Something that I really enjoy having is, is knowing what the community wants. So um, during this time, um, you know, it's very difficult to find a good leader of such a huge school system. And I'm exceptionally proud of Mr. Burke, um, especially this week when he decided to take on substituting at Forest Hill. Um, that had literally had me laughing all week and just so happy. Everyone I kept saying to, I was like, what an amazing superintendent that he would be willing to take on this challenge. Um, I've, I've had an opportunity to spend a day in a classroom. It is super difficult. Um, teachers are unbelievable. It's the most exhausting day you'll ever have. And so I was thrilled that he was actually taking it on and, and teaching students. And to me, such a good sign of a leader. It's such an amazing sign of a servant leader, of a person who, who really gets into the work. Also, the fact that he's able to um, realize that this is a deficit in our system right now, that we're lacking substitutes, and this is a way that we can get some. So I want to say thank you to all the staff in this building who have gone out and will go out to fill these gaps. This is, is huge. It's really a big thing. So um, one of the things that I think that we need to do, well, two things I think we need to do as a part of um, the superintendent coming on board in this way is to still commit to doing meetings with the community, still have a meeting with each one of our um, school board districts and have the community come out and still have the ability to ask him questions. And I think this is very important. And though I think we have the perfect guy for the job, I want you all to believe that too. So that's one of the things I would say. The second thing that I think we have to do, um, as meeting two weeks ago, we talked about metrics. Um, I think the metrics are super important. It's basically how we decide when to get rid of masks. And for all of you that have been talking about this for a long time, I do hear you on this. 
I think it's very important that we publish those, so I'm hopeful. I've been hearing from staff that they should be going up on our website tomorrow. And when we have that up, you'll be able to see what our goals are for getting back to um, having opportunity for families to opt out. Um, and I think that that is all due to the superintendent's leadership um, putting that out a few weeks ago. So um, I'm very proud of him. And I just wanted to put this at the beginning of my comments rather than wait till the superintendent's time because I know we'll lose some of our, our audience. So I wanted to make sure to get that out there. Um, but most of all, I'm super excited that tonight is the night we get to choose our new superintendent. Thank you. Hey, Ms. Whitfield, Mrs. Andrews. Thank you and good afternoon to everyone. It's my pleasure to give you a few comments tonight and especially uh, for the village of Wellington. Uh, it's so important to have partnerships with the community and the village of Wellington has been a super partner with the school district of Palm Beach County. And just this past week, the village of Wellington had their annual 2022 Keeley Spinelli Grant Awards. The uh, Village of Wellington has been doing these awards for pretty close to nine years. And I want to say that Keila Spinelli was one of the school district's employees when she lived. She was an awesome principal and administrator, and she was very, very loved by so many people. She left a legacy that is so great. And the Village of Wellington felt like it was necessary to do something special for Keeley Spinelli because she was a principal and an administrator in the village of Wellington. So this past week, the village of Wellington gave $400,000 total for every school. Absolutely, that's a, big, that's a big clap. For all of their schools in the village, each school received $36,367. These dollars will go to help those children needed as, needing assistance with student achievement. But over the years, the Village of Wellington has given $3.4 million to this Keeley Spinelli grant. And the Village of Wellington feels that it's important that we put your mouth and your money together to make a difference for positive, supportive education for children. So the superintendent was out there to say thank you, all of the principals were there to say thank you as they received their big checks. The area and region teams were out there. We were all out there saying thank you for this continued support for our schools and our children. Thank you, Village of Wellington, for always being a trendsetter on top of academic achievement for the children in the community. And I also attended Thank a Teacher at Crestwood Middle School. It was such a surprise for the uh, handbells teacher, Mrs. Johnson. We all entered her class and she was so surprised to see Thank a Teacher and the children said, yay, this is the teacher to be celebrated. So Ms. Johnson, all that you do for handbells and the arts at Crestwood Middle School, we appreciate your work. You are awesome. You always make a difference and your children testified to that as we celebrated you this past week. And lastly, I too want to say that I'm happy tonight to see Superintendent Mike Burke uh, voted in as our permanent superintendent. I can say that I know Mr. Burke because we work together right here in this building. And I think that this is a wonderful time for the school district of Palm Beach County to have one of our own who grew up here with us taking care of our finances throughout the years, being an expert there, but also participated in academic programs and achievements to help our children. So it's an exciting night tonight. I'm happy to be here and thank you all for everything that you do within the school district of Palm Beach County. Thank you, Mrs. Anderson, Dr. Uh, Mrs. Andrews, Dr. Robinson. Thank you. As many of you know, the Council of Great City Schools annual conference started yesterday. I'm always inspired by the work being done by school districts around the country. And while I'm tempted to share what I learned from sessions today, I will force myself to only speak about one initiative that was presented yesterday. I want to highlight this not only because it's such an important issue, but because I think we sometimes wear blinders as well as the fact that another school district has actually paved the way. So Erica Mitchell of the Atlanta Board of Education gave a very enlightening presentation on protecting students from exploitation, specifically sexual exploitation. She gave startling statistics on human trafficking, including that 96% of trafficking victims are female 
and transgender students are at great risk. 50% of tra trafficking victims are children. The average lifespan of a child victim once taken is seven years. And the average trafficked child is purchased 5.4 times per day. And the heat map that she showed showed Palm Beach County to be a hot spot. So while the term trafficking was used, they really focus on domestic minor sex trafficking. And she highlighted the red flags or risk factors and signs. She reported that the most common sign of a student who was trafficked domestically was sleeping in class. And how many times have we heard about children sleeping in class? And at least for me, it did not cross my mind. So Atlantic Public Schools responded. They created a policy with domestic minor sex trafficking protocols. They trained faculty and staff on risk factors and signs of trafficking, including trauma-informed debriefing. They educated students to increase their awareness, and they created care response incident teams, specifically trained staff to respectfully respond to incidences of trafficking in a way that's such that the victim was not re-traumatized. They partnered with community, including neighborhood associations, elected officials, faith leaders, law enforcement, and others. So my request is that we put domestic minor sex trafficking on our radar as an issue to be addressed. We start by learning from Atlantic Public Schools and reinforce the message now to faculty and staff that any suspicions of abuse including domestic minor sex abuse trafficking, be reported to the DCF hotline as well as to our IG immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Vice Chairwoman Brill. All right, board members, as, as you all know, when we usually at this meeting, we recognize the families and our employees that have passed away. So I'd like to take a few minutes to recognize those. Gregory Carroll, she was a teacher at Lake Worth Middle School. She was born in December 1978 and died in August of 2021. Wanda Cochran, she was a manager of food service at Pahokee Elementary. She was born in June of 1972. She died in September 2021. Dwayne, Dwayne Dukes, he was a behavioral physical needs assistant too at Lake Worth High School. He was born November 1964 and died September 4th, 2021. Anthony Johnson was a teacher at Lakeshore Middle. He was born in May 1972, died August 2021. Marcus Medina, teacher, Highland Elementary, born July 1971, died August 2021. Lee Neal, school bus attendant, transportation services, was born in August of 1951, died September 2021. Elizabeth Ross, behavioral, physical needs assistant one at Wellington Landings Middle School. She was born in June of 1992. She died in August of 2021. Gloria Shannon, teacher at Gove Elementary. She was born in January of 1957. She died August 2021, and Brandon Spann, Behavioral Physical Needs Assistant to Rolling Greens Elementary, was born in December 1981 and died August 2021. If we could take a moment of silence for these employees and their families. Thank you all. That'll move us to- Mr. Barbieri, I just wanted to correct one of the things I said in my comments, if I could really quickly. Pardon me? I wanted to correct something I said in my comments, if I could really yeah. quickly. I said tomorrow the metrics would be out. Apparently it's soon, okay. but not to be determined as tomorrow. Okay, my Ms. apologies. Swift. Thank you. Student, our student government, uh, President Logan, are you here on the screen or with us? Yeah, I'm here, hi. Good afternoon. Okay. Since the beginning of the school year, students have been busy planning, organizing, and carrying out their homecoming week and dances. Many schools have also been planning different activities for the fall slash Halloween season. American Heritage High School collected costumes for orphanages. West Boca High School is carrying out a pumpkin patch all of October, and many other high schools have been working on fall fest. Aside from these fall festivities, at the end of last year, a resolution was passed among schools in our county in regards to removing sexually suggestive from the school board policy 5.182 dress code submitted by Seminole Ridge Community High School. I wanted to bring it to the board's attention in hopes of removing sexually suggestive 
sexually suggestive so that administrators and staff do not have to make a judgment on what they determine to have sexual nature, as well as making a dress code situation more comfortable for both the administrator and student. The school board policy has been written for all schools in the district, including elementary and middle schools, that all students, especially minors, should not have been associated with any aspect of the word sexual. The current Palm Beach County School Board policy includes many examples of what would be deemed as out of dress code, thereby negating the need for the phrase sexually suggestive and determining appropriateness of clothing. Finally, I would like to mention that both Miami-Dade and Broward County do not use sexually suggestive in their dress code. Thank you. Thank you. Academic Advisory Committee, uh, IT, would you run that message from the chair? Good evening, Chairman Barbieri, school board members, Superintendent Burke, and staff. My name is Laura Feldman. I am honored to speak with you tonight as the chair of the Academic Advisory Committee. The committee met virtually on October 11th and heard presentations regarding exceptional student education and the master board process. During the ESC presentation, we learned of Florida's rule change regarding the maximum IQ required to qualify for access point standards. We were informed that the district staff is reviewing each student's uh, currently within this program and reevaluating the student if needed. The committee members were concerned about the notification to parents regarding these changes. Instead of sending this information out to all BSC parents and guardians, district staff is notifying parents and guardians individually. A committee member also asked regarding the department's efforts to address the disproportionate number of black students in the ESC program. Staff explained that the ESC department is collaborating with the Equity and Wellness Department for trainings and other efforts. They are focusing on the multi-tiered system of supports and using research and evidence-based practices to inform implementation. The committee member also asked for a follow-up to learn how these collaborations and efforts have impacted the disproportionate number of black students in ESC education. During the master board presentation, we discussed enrollments in classes at the elementary and middle school level to prepare students for success in advanced college level coursework in high school, for example, AP, ACE, IB, and dual enrollment classes. A committee member raised the question whether there will be efforts to mimic the AMPROP program, which advances elementary students in math, to enable students to advance in social studies, English language arts, and or science. As the graphs presented showed disaggregated information for students' enrollment in these advanced courses, a committee member asked for a follow-up regarding the enrollment information the first day of school after the 10-day count and in January to see whether the students are switching out of these courses if they do not have sufficient supports to be successful. A committee member also asked whether there have been efforts to seek and use student input, perhaps through school climate surveys, to understand the reason for the lack of enrollment in advanced coursework. There was also a question as to the district's plan to address the disproportionate number of English language learners and exceptional student education students who are successful within, within these courses. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Well, the Audit Committee report and the Construction Oversight Review Committee report has been added to the agenda. Is there anyone here from diversity, the Diversity Committee? Ms. Postal? Good evening, board chair, board members, staff, and everyone in your respective places. Charmaine Postal, District Diversity Equity Chair. Chief of Equity, or the District Diversity and Equity Committee met last month, uh, September 28th at 9 a.m. Um, we had a ch the Chief of Equity and Wellness always reported, Mr. Joseph Sanchez. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be reporting this right now. Is it public, Mr. Oswald? Okay. <laughs> Chief of Equity Wellness reported that Mr. Sanchez will now be the new operating officer. So the DDEC would like to um, thank Mr. Sanchez for his hard work, his dedication. And while we lost you, we know that the district um, have gained a well, well-deserved um, individual. So we look forward for the work that you're, you'll be doing on behalf of the district. The DDC would also like to welcome the new director of multicultural, Melissa Patterson, hailing from John A. Leonard High School. So welcome, Ms. Patterson. We'll be working together. The committee received updates on concordance scores by zip code. Um, the greatest impacts are along the I-95 coastlines. 
glades area, and typically the free and reduced lunch pattern areas. Um, impact was defined as having worse outcomes in graduation rates, where ELL have the greatest impact. And when you look at the heat map that was provided to us, there was direct um, correlation to the central locations where many ELL students reside. The committee stressed the point to utilize um, stress the point to the board, to the superintendent and staff, to utilize the advisory committees, not only the DDEC committees, but the other co respective committees, utilize them um, when it comes to implementation of processes, practices, policies, um, as we are from the community, you have tasked us with um, these implementation or um, input with respect to the implementation, we just ask that you utilize the voices that you have at the table um, while you're creating these processes and practices and policies, not after they have already been done, then you're sharing it with us. Um, the committee asks that if there is a way to get student voices with respect to uh, mass mandates, if there is a way to get student voices and how we are activating their voices or getting their point, um, point of view across, are we having enough of a populace to hear directly from the students um, who have to deal with the mass issues and the mass mandates on a day-to-day -day basis, um, or are we just listening to the same adults that come to before you or um, at your in your offices? So we want to know how are we activating those students' um, voices. Another issue this, the committee or concern that the committee have addressed is with respect to um, parent engagement. How are we engaging our parents? Um, aside from the typical social media, uh, five, you know, the Friday at five, um, how are we engaging our parents? How are we getting there and meeting them where they are? And um, how are the parents communicating with us? And we're not talking about the minority parents that are here at this meeting regarding one issue. We're talking about, respectively, all the issues that are occurring when it comes to the academics um, issues in our district. How are we getting that information to our parents, whether it's ESC, whether it's um, the concerns for the ESC, whether it's the concerns for the high, uh, high school concordance scores, how are we engaging the parents? The committee also asked for a discussion regarding standardized equitable practices. Um, there seemed to be a concern, a great concern regarding um, practices across the board, whether it's mass mandates, whether it's practices of how parents come into the school. Some schools are allowing parents. Some schools are not allowing parents. Some schools to have a meeting. The parents can't even go in the school to have the meeting. They want to have, um, you know, uh, computer or virtual meetings. And some schools are allowing that. And we have to be mindful that some parents as it was discussed in the committee, some parents have two kids at two different schools, so there's a practice that's being done at one school and a totally different practice being, being done at another school. So we would go into further discussion at this month's October's meeting where we discuss equitable standardized practices, not only about mass mandates, but about academics as well. A committee shared a concern regarding a disconnect with COVID procedures, and that's what really stemmed that conversation um, regarding standardized equitable practices, but also how we are teaching our kids, um, whether it's ELL, ESC, um, there was the, the standard practices are not equitable. Some students are getting more, some students are getting less, and they wanna know how can we be consistent throughout um, how can we be consistent throughout the district and how when we're making decisions, it comes from the top and at this district and it's funneled down directly to all schools and not just every school teacher, um, principal by principal, teacher by teacher get to make decisions. But when there's a decision, Mr. Superintendent, the committee is asking that we in implement that decision from the district on down and enforce that decision as well from the, dis um, the district on down. Our next meeting is scheduled for Thursday at 9 a.m. It is a hybrid meeting, so it can be here or virtual. And you can get the information on the district calendar regarding our next meeting. Thank you so much, and have a great evening. Thank you, Ms. Bosu. <clears throat> we'll go to delegates and elected officials. I'm going to call several names. Just whoever's closest to the microphone, just come on up. James Gavrillo is president and CEO of the Education Foundation. Jen Martinez, president of the Florida PTA. Kelly Smallridge, president and CEO of the Business Development Board and Corey Brooks, the Palm Beach School Administrators Association. Good 
Good evening, Chairman Barbieri, members of the school board, and Superintendent Burke. Um, two, uh, two weeks ago, we passed out the Go Teach Grant Awards. We've talked a little bit about those in the past, but I did want to share with you an update and give you some numbers. The school board members have a full report in front of you. We're trying to be more data-driven, so we have hard facts in front of us. From last year to this year, we increased the amount awarded from 112,000 to 178,000. From 73 grants last year, we awarded 88 grants this year, affecting 846 teachers and 15,000 students last year. This year, GoTeach grants will touch the lives of 1,352 teachers and 23,714 students. These grants are spread out over 65 schools, so it's an incredible program. More data that you have in front of you, 105 of these grants are going to Title I schools. We love the distribution throughout the district. 19% um, went to schools in the north, 40% in the central, 28% in the south, and 10% out west. So we'll be working with the western part to make sure they apply uh, more next year. All credit in this program goes to Jennifer Etheridge and Becky Youngman I'm from the district. When these two ladies take on something, just batten down the hatches and hold on because it's gonna grow. Finally, with my last couple of minutes, I wish to speak to the school board. And I want to congratulate you on a, on a decision you have made. Years ago, I was honored to go to Harvard Business School as part of Strategic Perspectives on Nonprofit Management. And one of our classes talked about the hiring of a CEO and how organizations, in particular nonprofits, usually get it wrong. They look for the wrong characteristics, which is why there's so much turnover in CEOs in the nonprofit world. Ladies and gentlemen, you got it right this time. A couple of you in your comments used the word leadership when describing Mr. Burke. Leadership is one of his many attributes. One of the things they taught us at Harvard Business School, managers do things right, leaders do the right thing. Very often when a board is hiring a CEO, they pick one or the other. They hire a manager or a leader. And Superintendent Burke, you've hired someone who is both a manager and a leader. He's a manager. He does things right. He's one of those annoying numbers people. All the columns add up, his paper clips are alphabetized, and everything is neat and organized on his desk. But he's not just a manager who does things right. He's a leader who does the right thing. A couple of you mentioned him going into schools this week and substitute teaching. I've shared with you in the past, watching him roll up his sleeves and pass out backpacks for an hour with Office Depot. Ladies and gentlemen, you have hired a manager and a leader. And at this critical time in the school district, as we emerge from the pandemic, with the turnover that we've had and all of the challenges facing us, I can think of no better person to bring those two qualities together and lead this district into the future. It's a new day. It's a new beginning. It's a new horizon. Ladies and gentlemen of the school board, you got it right. You hired a manager and a leader, and we, the Education Foundation, congratulate you. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Barbieri, Vice Chair Brill, Board Members and Superintendent Burke. I'm Jen Martinez, your Florida PTA President. I'm going across the state advocating for parent engagement and parent involvement. This particular subject ties in perfectly this evening with the basic policy of PTA. The organization shall work with the schools to provide quality education for all children and youth and shall seek to participate in the decision-making process establishing school board policies. Recognizing the legal responsibility to make decisions has been delegated by the people to the boards of education, state education authorities, and local education authorities. Tying that in with the national PTA position statement of parent involvement in site-based school decision-making, the National PTA and its constituent organizations advocate for legislation policies and bargaining agreements that protect the right of parental involvement in site-based shared decision-making, and it be further resolved the National PTA and its constituent organizations advocate for models of site-based decision-making which provide for equitable participation among parents, students, community members, principals, teachers, and other staff which promote an environment in which parents are valued as essential partners in their children's education and development. With that being said, promoting the PTA values of collaboration, commitment, diversity, respect, and accountability. 
It is also my privilege to have worked since 2008 with different perspectives with current and previous superintendents going back to Art Johnson and Bill Malone. Yes, I've been here a little while. It is important for the superintendent and the board to respect different perspectives, promote parent involvement, promote the national PTA standards of excellence and be inclusive of them. Invite and encourage stakeholder involvement on all district committees. Making the tough decisions, even knowing that what decision is right for one family isn't always right for the other families. Superintendent Burke, the one that you will be electing this evening, has thought out of the box, sending us to Tallahassee to increase mills and supporting and implementing since 2008 referendums to secure fine arts and education, crossing guards, and more. Your decision tonight is to lead the Palm Beach County School District to the future with a new leader that will bring different perspectives, support parental involvement, and stakeholder decisions on all committees. As previous speakers have said, you've already heard the ways of making a difference by rolling up the sleeves and getting involved. So the only thing I will correct Superintendent Burke on is, is he looks great in orange. Go Gators. Thank you. Kelly Smallridge, Corey Brooks, Palm Beach County Supervisor of Elections, Wendy Sartori-Link, and Economic Council Chairwoman, Michelle Jacobs. <laughs> Ladies, I don't know who you are, but if you do it again, I'm going to ask school police to... The, officer, whoever that is... On that side over there, she leaves too. You're going to unmask them or we're going to destroy them for treason. Who wants me? All right, go ahead, ma'am. Sure, thank you. Good evening. My name is Michelle Jacobs. I'm the president and CEO for the Economic Council of Palm Beach County. Thank you, Chair Barbieri, Vice Chair Brill, board members, and Superintendent Burke for inviting us here today. I wanted to first thank you, as well as all district staff members, for the outstanding way that you have navigated the last 20 months. It has not been easy. As the preeminent business organization in Palm Beach County, we're comprised of the top business leaders across many industries. The Economic Council has and will continue to take a very active interest in our educational system, from K-12 to to post-secondary to trade. For so many decades, we have done this, and we've been so proud of the successes that our district has had, particularly this year, over the last um, year navigating the pandemic. We have, we have enjoyed a very collaborative relationship with you, and in particular with Mr. Burke, um, over the years in his various positions at, on the uh, executive cabinet for this district. Um, we're extremely excited to embark and collaborate with Mr. Burke in his new assignment as the permanent superintendent. We congratulate you, this board, for taking the bold step to first promote Mr. Burke as interim in such a timely and swift fashion. We really needed that at this point in time. And for tonight, in discussing and improving the motion to make his leadership here in Palm Beach County permanent. Bravo to you. Our members are in full support of making uh, Mr. Burke the permanent superintendent, and we look forward to a long and very productive partnership together. Thank you so much for your tireless work. On behalf of the hundreds of thousands of students here in Palm Beach County, we're so fortunate to have you here leading this charge. Have a good evening. Thank you. Kelly Smallridge. I can't see. Supervisor of Elections, you're up. Good evening. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak to you, the Honorable Board School Board members and Mr. Burt. I'm Wendy Sartori Link, Supervisor of Elections for Palm Beach County. And I'm also a proud graduate of K through 12 here in the Palm Beach County School District. Uh, so I've been here for a long time. Our office has enjoyed a very good long-standing relationship with the school district with elections uh, as we use a number of your schools, as you know, for polling locations. Uh, we believe that the elections are a great way to connect the communities uh, to our schools 
particularly with many of our voters who don't have any children in the schools. It's a convenient and a secure and easy way to bring our voters into schools and into the classrooms to see oftentimes students are on campus, sometimes they're not, but there is that great connection and everybody really is grateful for the great partnership we have. We're also really strongly focused on educating the students about the elections process, and we want to continue to work with the school district and the teachers to offer resources and opportunities, including offering to bring our voting equipment into the schools uh, to run for those schools who are interested for us to run their student government elections. Our belief is that that gives the opportunity for students in a very non-threatening environment to have an opportunity to use the voting equipment so that when they uh, hopefully uh, register or at least pre-register, they're going to be ready to, to move on to voting when it's time. Uh, we are also looking for opportunities to work with school with our students as poll workers. We had a number of our students be poll workers that were pre-registered. It's a paid position and it's often a great opportunity for them to earn some money as well as to learn a lot about our elections process. So we recently had the opportunity to work with Mr. Burke uh, in discussing these things as well as many other exciting issues that we think are going to come forward and opportunities for our office to work with the school district, including recently discussing some of our uh, election staff working as uh, substitute teachers as well. So we're looking for ways that we can be good partners back with you. And so I just wanted to share with you Mr. Burke's longtime experience with the school district, his ability to, to know what's happening in our community because he's from here, and the opportunities that he's had to work with many people over the years are a huge asset uh, to our community. Uh, it's very clear to me with his calm demeanor and the way he talks about the students, how much he cares about the students, and that he will always continue to put our students first both their safety as well as, of course, their education. And we're looking forward to working with him as he leads the school district well. So just wanted to say to you from the elections office, uh, should you move forward with Mr. Burke tonight, we thank you for the opportunity and we hope to continue our great relationship with you and working with Mr. Burke. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> Go ahead. Good evening, Board Chair Barbieri, Vice Chair Brill, Board Members, and Superintendent Burke. I am not Corey Brooks, but I am Bob Hatcher. I am honored to be the principal of Western Pines Community Middle School, humbled to be the principal's division chair for Palm Beach County School Administrators Association, and grateful to be a parent of both a recent graduate and a freshman at Seminole Ridge High School. For 36 years, my father was a proud member of School District Palm Beach, and I have continued our family tradition for the last 30 years to be all in for Team Palm Beach. I am a homegrown product of Palm Beach County School District. I started kindergarten in 1972 at Winbrook Elementary. I am here tonight to ask you to continue to boldly move our district forward with the stability, leadership, and momentum that you created when you appointed Mr. Burke as our interim superintendent. The Administrators Association continues to be confident that Mr. Burke is the right person for the job right now. I would also ask that uh, we all keep the victims and families of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in our thoughts. The individual responsible pled guilty today, and it is our hope that the families can now start to begin to know what healing and peace is. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Hatcher. You were next on the list behind Mr. Brooks. My mistake. Uh, Kelly Smallridge, Claudia Bartow, President, Junior Achievement at Palm Beach Treasure Coast, and Gordon Longhofer, Vice President of CTA. Good evening, Bar Chairman Barbieri, school board members, and Superintendent. I'm Claudia Kirk Bartow, President of Junior Achievement of the Palm Beaches and Treasure Coast. And the last time I spoke to you, I didn't need these glasses, so this is super fun. I am the mother of three um, children in the Palm Beach County School District and the godmother of one out in Pahokee, um, at Pahokee Middle High. 
So um, I think I speak on behalf of my children, on behalf of the children that Junior Achievement works with, to share with you just a little bit about what we're up to um, and our support for the superintendent as several other people have spoken about. So at Junior Achievement, um, we commit about a million dollars a year in support to the district um, to empower and inspire young people to succeed in the global economy by working with students kindergarten through 12th grade and bringing volunteers in the schools to build a bridge of engagement between the classroom and the community. And together with our educational partners, we make learning relevant to every student's future by infusing authenticity, business connectivity, and real world um, role models every day to learning. Two years ago, we were reaching about 20,000 students. Then we reached 40,000 when the pandemic hit. And this year, we just reached almost um, 60,000 students um, through our programs, both virtually um, throughout the district. And I think um, it's really important to know that I've seen superintendents come and go in the district and I've had the opportunity in the last, to work really with the last four. And they've all had unique qualifications. But right now I don't think that there's any better person to lead the district. The person that has had the opportunity to raise his children in the district, to know where every dollar goes in the district, <laughs> that's kind of important to me um, in running Junior Achievement. And I've had the opportunity recently to work on a project with him. The fact that he was so responsive, collaborative, knew um, every question to ask me about how this would work or how it wouldn't work. The, de the level of detail was remarkable. But I don't think I can speak as eloquently as Michelle or James um, to say what a great um, human being he is, and I know it's a tumultuous time right now, um, but his calmness and demeanor and leadership is so important um, for us as parents, as community leaders and students. So thank you for letting me speak tonight. Um, I'll continue to come back um, and give you an update on junior achievement, but I just wanted to take this opportunity tonight. Thank you so much for all you do um, thank, thank, every day. Thank you, President Bartow. Chairman Barbieri, Vice Chair Brill, uh, members of the board, guests, my name is Gordon Longhofer. I am the Vice President of the Palm Beach County Classroom Teachers Association. Thrilled to be here again tonight to speak to you. Um, I am also here tonight on behalf of President Justin Katz and the entire CTA to lend our support for the appointment of Michael Burke as Superintendent. He is a knowledgeable, professional, a man, he is a possessor of a steady hand, and we know that those are extremely good qualities. We're confident that we can work well together to positively impact all students, but especially those who may be suffering due to the COVID slide. To accomplish this, however, the district must always take seriously the, in, the input and concerns of its professional educators. We all have the same common goal, fundamental desire to be successful at our job, that one job that is to educate the children of Palm Beach County. We also have tremendous experience, knowledge, and skills in the more than 13,000 teachers in our district. I am personally convinced that if we can move beyond the typical labor versus management mentality, we will deliver a world-class education to all of our students, and together we will also improve the profession of education and teachers, something that is urgently needed at this point in time. Thank you all very much and have a good evening. Thank you, Vice President Longhoffer. Patricia Trejo, President of Florida Association of Latino Administrators and Superintendents. Dr. Kathy Gunlack, League of Women Voters of Palm Beach County. Go ahead, ma'am. Good evening, school board chair, school board members, and Superintendent Burke. I am Patricia Trejo the president of the Florida Association of Latino Administrators and Superintendents. And I'm speaking on behalf of Florida Aras regarding BRD1. Our organization is a 5013C nonprofit organization that serves as a state affiliate of the National Association of Latino Administrators and Superintendents. We serve to meet the needs of all students with a particular emphasis on Hispanic Latino youth, 
by building capacity, promoting best practices, and helping to transform educational institutions across the state of Florida. We fully support the Florida State Statute 1003.42p, which highlights the importance of all students to learn about Hispanic contributions made to the United States. Our objectives also include advocating educational policies, advancing equity and equal access to education, building pathways for leadership, fostering community outreach and parental engagement, and providing opportunities for educators to network and collaborate. Within the School District of Palm Beach County, we have observed that there are currently 69,771 students that are of Hispanic Latino descent, which is 36.9%, making them the majority. Out of 174 principals, 10% are of a Hispanic Latino descent. Out of 362 assistant principals, 15% are Hispanic Latinos. There are 819 district administrators. Out of those, 16% are of Hispanic Latino descent. On September 16, 2021, the Executive Board of Directors and I met with Superintendent Michael Burke, who was welcoming, receptive, and open. He was extremely open-minded to what we had to share regarding the underrepresentation of Hispanic Latino administrators. As we move forward in collaboration with Superintendent Burke, we are hopeful that the inequities will be addressed and that there will be an increase in hiring and promoting of more Hispanic Latinos. On behalf of the Florida Alas Executive Board of Directors, we appreciate Superintendent Burke's cooperation and collaboration. We look forward to working with him to help ensure that our diverse student population is reflected in the teachers and administrators that serve them. Thank you. Thank you, President Trejo. Dr. Kathy Gunlack, Julia DeTolo, President and CEO of the Career Source, Palm Beach County. Good, Good evening, ma'am. Mr. Barbieri, Superintendent Burke, school board members, and members of the dais. I am Dr. Kathy Gunlack, President of the League of Women Voters of Palm Beach County. I am here to congratulate you all on your choice of Mr. Burke as the Superintendent of Schools. While I often sat on the opposite side of the table from Mr. Burke when I was president of the Classroom Teachers Association for negotiations, and we often disagreed, he was doing his job as was I, so no hard feelings. I want to thank Mr. Burke for speaking to the League of Women Voters in September as he was warmly received and greatly appreciated for letting us know how the district was do doing during these difficult times. I also want to thank Mr. Oswald and Dr. Musinic for presenting during our September as Public Education Month programs. Mr. Burke has assembled an outstanding leadership team to help guide the district. His knowledge of the district and its workings are immeasurable. Mr. Burke will be a great leader for the district with his calm demeanor, his professionalism, as well as his kind nature. I want to thank you, board members, for keeping the students and employees as safe as possible, and thank you for the work you do each and every day. Good evening. Thank you, President Gunlack. Chairman Barbieri, school board, Mr. Burke. I'm Julia DeTolo, President and CEO of Career Source Palm Beach County, and I'm honored here to speak here tonight and to thank you for having me in, uh, and to support the appointment of a permanent superintendent of schools, Mr. Burke. Mr. Burke brings two decades of expertise and engagement in local education, economic, and business to benefit students, employers, and residents. Here's an example of what that means. At Career Source Palm Beach County, we've been working closely with the school district and with businesses and employers to build a strong local jobs pipeline for graduates in a unique initiative that we call the Palm Beach Pathway. In short, the district trains students in the skills they need to fill rewarding, high-demand jobs to meet the needs of local employers. We help with educational scholarships, job search workshops, and events such as the BDB's annual Claim Your Future Showcase, and make connections with employment and training programs. This is helping to address a shortage of workers in every industry sector in Palm Beach County, and we are training the next generation's workforce. Last month, we presented the Palm Beach Initiative 
at the state level to the Department of Education, the Department of Economic Opportunity, and Career Source Florida. Good things are happening in Palm Beach, and we're pleased and proud that Mr. Burke will continue to play a leading role in this success. Career Source Palm Beach County wishes you, the board, and Mr. Burke, continued success. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Detol. <clears throat> Chuck Ridley, political coordinator for SEIU, and Juan Pagan from the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Buenas noches. Good evening. You know, I'd like to say welcome to everybody and thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, one of the things that I had the opportunity, you know, I've been a resident of this county for over 30 years right now. And one of the things when I moved here was that the Hispanic population was less than 10% when I was here. As we move forward and we look at the census 2020, the projection is going to be anywhere between 24, 26% is going to be. But at the same time, we look at the students in the school district, guess what? They're about 37% of the Hispanic students of the 293,000 students you have. But at the same time, you know, the Florida Hispanic American Chamber of Commerce started here as a Puerto Rican Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And then as we move over the years, over the last 17 years, it so happened that we kept growing, we kept changing, and we have representation of over 21 countries that are residents from Palm Beach County, from Latin America and the Caribbean. So here we are. And at the time when Mr. Burt was named, you know, the school district had been a part of us for many years, and I'm one of the committees that she spoke a little while on disparity and equity, you know, and we have the opportunity to interact with Mr. Baird. And we have another organization within our chamber that is called the Hispanic Pastors Association. Over 500 Hispanic churches between Lantana and Jupiter, you know. So, and they, he was very accepting. He was very well tolerating and understanding what their feelings are, what their needs are. So we're looking forward to continue working together. Thank you, Mr. Berg for helping us, you know, working together, because at the end, this is not about the chamber. This is about the community. How do we work together regardless of where you come from? You know, we don't care, you know, what color you are, what is your accent coming from. It is about working together, as we would like to say. Thank you, and welcome, Dr. Burke. And you surrounded yourself with one of the best, in my personal opinion, educators team, because you're good with the numbers, but the numbers need also education. So you have the greatest team in Palm Beach County ever for to do that job. Thank you. Thank you. Chuck Ridley, Kelly Smallridge, President, CEO, Business Development Board. All right, we'll start the recordings of the delegates, IT. Greetings, Board Chair Barbieri, Board Members, and Superintendent Burke. This is P.J. Dialis, the President of the Staff Association, to speak on BRD 1 and 2. On behalf of the Palm Beach County Staff Association, the 1,500 MBU employees we represent, we wholeheartedly support making Mr. Michael J. Burke our permanent superintendent. In these turbulent times, we need the steady hand of a trusted leader that has the district's best interests at heart. Mr. Burke is the leader we need his dedication to our students, parents, and staff has been demonstrated throughout the years. The Staff Association looks forward to moving ahead with Mr. Burke at the helm as our superintendent and encourages the board to move forward with his contract. Good evening. Hello, this is Darcy Davis, CEO of the Healthcare District of Palm Beach County. I'm calling about uh, agenda item BRD1, and I'm calling in support of Mike Burke's appointment as superintendent of the school district of Palm Beach County. For the past four years, Mr. Burke has served as a volunteer member of the Healthcare District of Palm Beach County's Finance and Audit Committee, providing financial expertise and guidance for our unique and complex public health care system. We appreciate his ongoing support of the school health program that staffs Healthcare District school nurses in nearly 200 public schools to keep students healthy and ready to learn. His advocacy of access to quality health care paved the way for the Healthcare District's partnership with the school district in the fight against COVID-19. Mr. Burke was instrumental in facilitating the mobilization of our mobile clinics to provide vaccinations to school district staff, students, and their families over the summer and at each of the high schools during the past two months. Mr. Burke is well-respected within our safety net organization as well as throughout the community. 
His experience, leadership, and dedication to Palm Beach County make him well suited to lead the 10th largest school district in the nation. Thank you so much. This is Darcy Davis. Good evening. My name is Ava Parker, and I'm the president of Palm Beach State College, and I'm speaking uh, regarding agenda item one. Um, and I'm so sorry that I cannot be there in person to speak in support of our new superintendent, uh, Mike Burke. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Mike in his capacity as the CFO for our school district. During those times, I found my engagement with Mike to be um, very positive. He always operated with a level of trust and um, integrity that I think is so important for those who are leading one of the most important organizations uh, within our county. And since uh, Mike has served as our interim, I've had the opportunity to meet with him and to spend some time with him throughout our community. I find him to be very welcoming and very supportive and always understanding the idea of us collaborating and coming together. You see, I think that Mike understands that the foundation that he builds for our students is the one that we have an opportunity to build upon here at Palm Beach State College. I appreciate the fact that in Mike, I will have a partner and someone who understands that our county is better when we work together. I certainly encourage the support for Mike and I am really looking forward to continuing our great work together. And I'm speaking on behalf at this point as the president of the college, or certainly as a parent of students within the Palm Beach County School District, I certainly feel that our district and my kids are personally in great hands with Mike as the leader of uh, Palm Beach County School District. Um, I look forward again to working with him and very happy to support um, his leadership and really support the decision that our school board has made to appoint him in this capacity. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Patrick Franklin, President and CEO of the Urban League of Palm Beach County, and I'm calling on reference to agenda item BRD-1. I'm calling in full support of Mike Burke being the new superintendent for Palm Beach County School District. We are, as the Urban League, are very much in favor of Mr. Burke by taking over as superintendent. I look forward to a very long-lasting uh, partnership with the school district and uh, Mr. Burke, and we support him 100%. Thank you, and have a great day. Good evening, Chairman Barbieri, school board members, superintendents, Burke, and staff. My name is Laura Feldman, and I'm honored to speak with you now tonight as the president of Palm Beach County Council of PTA PTSA. I would like to take a moment to express PTA's appreciation to Superintendent Burke for his leadership during this time. We are thankful for the work that has been done to maintain student safety and well-being while supporting success and growth for all students. PTA greatly appreciates the efforts of Mr. Burke and staff and all the staff to work with PTA to make every child's potential a reality by engaging and empowering families and communities to advocate for all children. We look forward to continuing continuing our work together. This month, County Council held a question and answer training to answer local unit questions. During this training, local units had the opportunity to learn from each other what has worked for them and where they could use some help. There's also, there is still time to participate in the Reflections Art Program. It's a competition program through which all students are encouraged to explore their creativity through dance, music competition, visual arts, photography, video, and literature. Students can submit their creations at the school level and then can possibly advance to the county council, state, and even the national level. If you're interested in establishing a program at your school, please contact Michelle Gunning, PBCC's Reflections Chair, via reflections.pbccpta at gmail.com. The deadline to submit entries to the county council is December 22nd. In January, Florida PTA's Legislative Conference will be a hybrid event with a low-cost registration for virtual attendance. Please go to Florida PTA's website, floridapta.org, for more information. Thank you very much for your time, and have a good evening. Good afternoon. I'm calling regarding BRD1. My name is Donya Roberts. 
I'm a co-chair for the Glades Career Readiness Roundtable at meets at the West Technical Facility in Bell Glade and have worked many, many years with the Tri-Cities Education, uh, Ministerial Association, many private entities uh, working towards uh, better service for our citizens out in the Glades area as it relates to adult ed and also all of our children. And I've been so pleasantly surprised to see the efforts that Michael Burke has made in uh, rolling up his sleeves, getting out to the Glades, being here for every event. He has done exactly what he said he would do. He is a man of his word. Um, we have not had in the past someone that has given as much face time and then really went uh, beyond and, and did what they said they were going to do to serve the citizens of the Glades communities. And I, for one, um, not speaking on behalf of the Glades Career Readiness Roundtable, but as co-chair of and working with many entities out in the Glades, am very excited for what we have to come and working with Michael Burke and support his um, permanency at the helm for our district 100%. Best of wishes. Thank you. Chuck Ridley, political coordinator for SEIU. To the superintendent, to the chair board, my name is Chuck Ridley and I am the political coordinator for SEIU. On behalf of SEIU, and our members and our staff, I would like to express my gratitude to the board and superintendent for placing the following memorandum on the agenda for tonight. As a result of this MOU, employees in our bargaining unit will receive a one-time retention and recruitment incentive for $1,000 to be paid no later than November 26. 2021. Board members, this recommendation is a symbol of our appreciation for employees that knowingly place their lives at risk. And they do this to ensure Palm Beach County students receive quality education. They're often the first and the last district employee many students see each day. They are truly essential workers and without them, this district comes to a halt. Superintendent Burke and new COO Joe Sanchez, this really is a good start. However, you both are aware that there are systemic and cultural issues impacting the non-instructional employees staff daily. While it may be easy to blame these concerns on the pandemic, truth be told, these systematic and cultural issues existed long before the pandemic. Issues such as low wages, not feeling valued, being disrespected by management, not having their voices heard on major decisions being made about their jobs, feeling passed over for positions that they're for, and for jobs that they're qualified to do. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. But what frustrates our members most is the number of years that they have met with senior staff to voice their concerns and le very little has changed. Many of our members have concluded that either management don't have the skills to address our concerns or they don't care. Superintendent Burke, Mr. Sanchez, the fact that the two of you are in the positions you are, are in now brings a small degree of hope. Both of you have long histories with the district. Nothing that I'm saying now should surprise either of you. In fact, you already have started a good working relationship with many of, our, in, many of the employees in our bargaining unit. You have the uh, opportunity to do something that has not happened in many years, which is to transform the work culture and climate so that all employees are valued. To the superintendent, deputy superintendent and C COO, on behalf of the member leaders, once again, thank you. The union looks forward to working with you on a new beginning. We, looking, we look forward to changing this toxic culture. We recognize that it takes time. We need you to recognize 
that non-instructional staff is no longer interested in talk. It is now time for action. Thank you, board, for letting me share. Is Ms. Smallridge here? Take us to agenda topic speakers. I'll call you three at a time. Please come up to the uh, podium on either side of the microphone, either side, wherever you're at. Chuck Shaw, Cindy Falco, and Angelique Contreras. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. I, uh, I was sitting outside when, Mr. when Mr. Burke uh, started his comments, and I have to say that um, I have to ask for equal time for FAU since there was an effort to recognize another Florida college. So, Mr. Burke, uh, be duly noted that that is an important one, too. So, figure a little levity on an evening that's always a struggle. It is my pleasure to be here and to be able to speak in support of Mr. Burke's uh, appointment to be the per Ms. Mr. Burke's appointment as permanent superintendent. Mr. Burke. Ladies and gentlemen, stop over there, or I'll clear the room. Stop. You heard earlier tonight with the other speakers the feeling that this community has, the business community, employees, um, all different aspects of this community that has support for what Mr. Burke has done and can do for this county. And as someone who has worked with, with Mike for a long time and have seen him in various roles, I think the decision that the board has made to appoint him as permanent superintendent is probably one of the better and most important decisions that you've ever made. And I think all of us who've served as board members realize that one of the most important things that a school board does is the appointment of a superintendent. And there'll be questions about why didn't we recruit, why didn't we do all kinds of things. The important thing is that Mr. Burke is part of this community. He's known by parents, he's known by employees, he's known by the business community, by the employees in other parts of this community. He is part of this community and he will serve this district in a very, very positive way. And I'm really, really pleased and proud of this board that y'all are considering the approval of BRD 1 and 2 tonight. Thank you so much because we are moving this district forward and I know Mr. Burke can do a really fantastic job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. Nice seeing you again. Cindy Falco, Angelique Contreras, Sandra Sullivan. Go ahead, ma'am. State your name. Oh, do I go first, sir? Go ahead. Okay, my name is Sandy Sullivan. I really would like for all the board members to uh, pay attention and not look at whatever's in front of them and please pay attention to all the parents and students and children that are here speaking, that are having the courage to come up here and speak. Uh, today I would like to speak on uh, number COM1, National Bullying and Prevention Awareness Month Proclamation. Um, I feel that there is bullying happening at our schools right from the top with these mandate decisions the school boards is making. This one-size-fits-all decisions are trickling down to, are trickling down and bullying principals, vice principals, teachers, lunch staff, parents, and especially students. Students have been physically, verbally, emotionally, and psychologically bullied by your mandate decisions. I'd like, I'd like to read a bit about, uh, of your proclamation, National Bullying Prevent Prevention and Awareness Month, October 2021. Thousands of children and adolescents nationally are affected by bullying annually and targeted 
of bullying and are likely to acquire physical, emotional, and learning problems. And students who are repeatedly bullied often fear such activities as riding a bus, going to school, and attending community activities. At what cost do you continue to bully our families and our children? I would like to continue reading a bit of your proclamation statement. And it be further resolved that Palm Beach County Schools, every employee, student, parent, guardian, volunteer, recreational program, community organization, hmm. organizations make conscious efforts and commitments not to add pain of others to do our best to look at, peop at people with caring eyes and serve as allies to all that are in need. I ask the school board members to use caring eyes, caring ears, caring voices, caring hearts, and caring souls to cultivate our schools and care for our children's and parents' decisions by ending any mandates. Everyone should have the choice of what they need to do that they think is best for their families. Thank you for your time. Danielle Underwood, Jen Showalter, Fiona Lachelles. I'm Jen Showalter, mother of three, candidate for Palm Beach School Board District 6, and a concerned parent, not a domestic terrorist. I'm here, like every month, to speak on BRD 1 and 2, COM 1, 4, and 5, and BD 1. Marcia Andrews is serving, severing her membership with the Florida Show School Board. Walter. What? That's BD 1. You can't speak on your candidacy. Your microphone's off. I warned you at the beginning of the meeting. Um, You're, done You're done speaking. 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 You can't mention candidacy for any elected office at this school board meeting. You're done. You're done speaking. Get away from, step away from the microphone. Gentlemen, you do that one more time and you're leaving. You're leaving. Go ahead, ma'am. Go ahead. Oh, excuse me a minute. Do we have a lady in the other room first that I called earlier? Cindy Falco? That would be me. Go ahead. I wanted to um, describe about how many years it takes to become a superintendent and what is the um, requisition, the requisite for a resume to be a superintendent. I do understand that Michael Burke has an extensive financial background, but he does not have a bachelor's degree in education of four years, nor does he gain teaching experience two to three years. One time substituting at a school does not constitute at two to three years actually teaching students. Uh, you're supposed to earn a master's degree in education for two years and gain experience in, in which he does have as administrator with the finances. Again, it takes about 11 to 14 years to be qualified for the position of a superintendent. When I listen to things that I hear the superintendent say, it, it's very disturbing, especially when parents are asking what they can do to help make a better community for the schools. And he then shares with them to get guns, to get lawyers and, and more money. That's really disturbing, even though I know he thought it was cute saying a little quote from a, a song. That's not cute, sir, especially when you're dealing with the public and with parents who are fighting for the very lives of their children. Okay, you've got masks on children. Sir, if you know anything about anything in the medical industry, you are creating child abuse. You are doing child abuse to those children. They cannot breathe properly. They're not getting enough oxygen to their cells in their body. They are going to get mold in their throat from breathing back in their own bacteria and carbon monoxide. Sir, if you really cared about the children as everybody there on your dais tries to pretend to, you would not be doing child abuse and doing the Nuremberg Code and all the other evils that you're doing and putting upon these children. I'm asking you, I'm asking you to do the right thing and stop with your insanity because this is insanity. And this whole control issue that's going on with the board, this is not America. I grew up in America, 
and we have our freedom, our rights, which God gave us, our unleanable rights, and no man can take it away. That means no one can put a lien on our rights. Now, I'm really disappointed that you have this position because you are not qualified. Yes, you're qualified as a financial advisor. You'd be great in the finances. But talking about children in a school and education, what's good for them, and then when a parent asks you a question, the words out of your mouth are more guns, lawyers, and money. Sir, that's an insult, and I take it personally that that is an insult to every parent, to every child, and even for the position that they're trying to put you in and saying that you have. Shame on you. Thank you. Go ahead, ma'am. State your name, please. Good evening, board. My name is Danielle Underwood. Um, I'm not be I'm not going to be so nice like all these other people that might have been paid to come here, all these delegates for their four minutes. But tonight, you're you appointed the superintendent, the interim superintendent, to his permanent position. Um, this is very concerning to myself and the community because when this position came available, you all promised the community, the stakeholders, and we, the parents, we, the people, the opportunity to have an opinion and a say on the new permanent choice. You discussed forming committees and such. We, the people, even respectfully suggested solutions and ideas. Now, fast forward a short amount of time, and you just appoint Mr. Burke to the position. You flat out lied and let we, the people, down. Now, that shouldn't be a surprise to any of us, because we all know that you are all liars and lawbreakers. But once again, corruption has occurred. This interim superintendent has, in a short time, ceded that he's been seated in that position has broken the law. He has threatened our community, including students and parents, and has flat out done a terrible job. He has violated code of ethics on numerous occasions. Instead of being selected, he should have been terminated. We the people are not asking, but demanding that you step down, Mr. Burke. You have no business being in charge of our children. Do the right thing and step down before we the people take legal action to have you removed for threatening us to bring lawyers, guns, and money. And the smirking and the shaking of your face that you have up there, we all see it. This is on public record. You are breaking Florida state law, and you are not above the law. You should be arrested and tried in criminal court. But for now, our State Board of Education will withhold your dollars. And in saying all of that, you all need to think about, he put this mask mandate and policy under this so-called policy that the superintendent has final say but once again you the board he works for you you guys need to come up with something and vote on it if he gives you a suggestion it's something that you all need to vote on it's not something that he just gets to make the final decision under some emergency order because palm beach county is not even under an emergency order anymore so we have kids that are missing out on their education we have kids that are being denied their free appropriate education I mean, how about justice for Fiona right here? 28 days. She has not stepped foot in school because they keep suspending her. And they even left her sitting without breakfast. 28 days, folks. Look at this little girl. 28 days of no school. You should be ashamed of yourselves. You shouldn't be able to put your head down on your pillow tonight with seeing her face. 28 days of no school. The next 15 seconds, I'm going to remind you, 28 days of no school. 28 days of no education, folks. What are you doing? Bailey Lachelle's Melissa Borden, Ashley Littlebod. Ma'am, in the other room, go ahead. Ms. Contreras, go ahead. Hello, board. My name is Angelique Contreras, and I wanted to speak on, um, I guess, the employment of Superintendent Burke. Um, it is my understanding that just a few months ago, we were told that the public was going to be able to have robust conversations with Mr. Burke and be a part of the decision making. Yet time and time again, this board has stripped away our rights to be included and be involved in these decision making. Burke, you have continued to go against parents' rights. You continue to um, speak about equity and equality and you wear an orange tie today for unity, yet 
we don't have unity on this school board. You haven't shown unity from that seat from the time that you have become the interim superintendent. Like Danielle Underwood has said, there's a little girl in that room by the name of Fiona who has missed 28 days of in-school education because of this board and the principals and the educators at her school. That is not unity. We should not allow that. So I do not agree with you being the superintendent. And I say this because we should be involved. There should be conversations that are being had. So if that means you delay signing the paper today, which is the right thing to do, that is the right thing to do. You should not be signing those papers today and becoming the superintendent of Palm Beach County. You should lead by example, and you have time and time again not done that for anybody in this community. So I do not feel that you are fit for the position at all. And I know that many may disagree with me, but you have to look at it from an equity and equality side, like everybody preaches about from this board. If you truly believe in equity and you truly believe in equality, then why are we being left out? Every single voice matters, every single one. Even the one that disagrees with you matters even more than the rest of them. That is the way this country works. We are only asking to be a part of it. We are not domestic terrorists. We do not need the FBI to investigate us. We don't need you to be emboldened to do things against our will. We are pissed off, yes, but we have every right to be because you have stripped every right away from us. And I will be back to speak on non-agenda. Thank you very much. I am, I am speaking about BD1. Hi, I am Fiona in second grade at Discovery Key Elementary. Mr. Berg, you should not become superintendent because you bully me. I have been getting suspended for 27 days, and one of those days did they, not, they did not give me breakfast. Do you think that's okay? And you think it's okay that you don't have to wear masks? You, the school board, are being a bully to me. I am on my 27th day of suspension because of you, the school board. It isn't fair that I have to wear a mask and you don't. I asked the principal why I couldn't do, I couldn't do my work in the classroom. She said, because I was getting suspended. And I said, what you're doing is against the law. And she said, these are the rules the scoreboard put in place and I don't wanna lose my job. So I'm still gonna stand up for what I believe in and do, not, do the right thing for all the kids, just not just myself. I hope you all go to jail for doing this to me. My family is proud of me. And Mr. Berg, I wanna say you suck, but instead your actions suck. Yes, you. I'm here to speak on BD1, Bailey Lachelle's. Um, Mr. Burke, you should become permanent superintendent. The bullying, harassment, harassment, stopping not even at the mental abuse to my eight-year-old. I don't think so. I'll tell you why I feel this way. August 31st, my daughter sat in a silent lunch. September 1st, was removed from class. September 2nd, in school suspension. September 3rd, one day out of school suspension. September 8th, two days out of school. The 13th was her first three-day suspension. 17th was her second three-day suspension. 24th, 3rd, 29th, 5th, 4th, sorry. Let's get down to October 7th. That was her sixth three-day out of school suspension, followed by October 12th and October 18th for her seventh and eighth three-day out of school suspensions. 12 referrals, 27 days of out-of-school suspension, 
30 days of discipline she's been out of the classroom because of your policies. Yeah. yeah. Here's the level four offenses that warrant a 10 day suspension according to this district. An imminent threat of violence, high level. Possession of a firearm or handgun. Battery of a Leo. Possession, use, or sale of an explosive device, aggravated assault, armed robbery, kidnapping, abduction, arson, a bomb threat, posting or transmitting a threat of mass shooting, terrorism, homicide, or a weapon. They get 10 days. And my eight-year-old is on 27 days of out-of-school suspensions because of not complying with your mask mandate? Mr. Burke, where was your 10-day suspension? And we're sitting here tapping you for superintendent? I mean, what a joke that is. You can joke about guns and money, but our kids can't. I hope you got the lawyers you need, because I'm not the only one coming after you. 27 days of out of school withholding my child's education. Look at her, Mr. Burke. Can you look at her? Can you look this way and look at my daughter? 27 days. Mr. Barbieri, I'm sorry, Mr. Burke. I had you confused. Mr. Barbieri, can you turn and look I at her? I can see you on the screen, ma'am. There's a screen in front of us. Oh. We can see you. <laughs> you don't want to look at her, do you? I can see her better Eight there. Years I can old. see her over there. I Eight can years it. old. 27 days out of school. Way to be proud of yourself. I hope you sleep well tonight. Uh, Emily Machika, Christina Manolis. Uh, you skipped me, sir. Go Ashley ahead. Labad. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. All right, I'm talking on BRD1, appointment of the superintendent, and I'm also talking about COM1. What makes a good superintendent? What's your name, ma'am? I name? already did, Ashley Labad. Thank you. What makes a good superintendent? Someone who works as a team with parents, students, teachers, administra administrators, and staff. Not, uh, not someone who tries to keep parents out of schools and take their rights away or label them as domestic terrorists. Number two, follows the law. It doesn't show kids how to break the law. Number three, allowing parents to have a say in their child's education. We don't co-parent with the government or anyone else. These are our kids. We care about them. That's why we're here. Number four, a leader, not a dictator. By saying things like we are making up our own rules or we send lawyers guns and money, in no way, shape, or form shows any leadership. It shows dictatorship. Let me give you the definition. A government or country in which total power is held by a dictator or a small group. Hmm. Sounds like the school board. Five, promote community within our schools, not pushing fear or division. Six, someone who listens to parents. Every meeting, we're ignored. I love how you invited a lot of people here to help you. In my nine years of teaching, this would have been my 10th. I have never seen anyone push division like I've seen in the past two years. The best schools that I've worked at have community, work as a team, and listen to everyone involved. This is not happening. The last meeting sounded like I was watching Saved by the Bell, except for you guys aren't good actors. Um, when the scripted words were said over and over that Mr. Burke should be our superintendent, I was like, oh, okay, they wrote that out for sure. I object to this in many ways. So do other parents. We need someone who truly cares about our schools, not an actor. Let's talk about the national bullying. I am glad that you want to do this, but maybe you should take a look at how you guys have been bullying people. For starters, on the Saturday before school started, you all decided to reinstate masks on staff and students going against the law. I was sent home for not masking on August 9th. I was pushed out of my position, but yet not fired, and I'm still in limbo. I have tons of colleagues and staff that I worked with that do not want to be forced to wear it and go through it because they cannot afford to lose their jobs, and they are too scared to speak up. Students have been segregated, yelled at, mistreated. They have been suspended, as you just heard. IEPs are not followed, 504s are not followed physically, and uh, you're physically, psychologically, and academically ruining these kids, and I saw it last year, so don't anyone tell me that I'm wrong. I saw it firsthand. Um, we are not a threat to you. We care about our kids, and you should be happy that we are here standing up for them. Tomorrow at 12.30, at 8.50, Joyce Kaufman Show, Jason Marin, I'll speak more about this. Please stand up and do the right thing, because I know somewhere in your hearts you care, and you can do better. I want you on the right side of history. I'm not saying right or left, Democrat or Republican. I want you to stand up. I love this school. I grew up in this school. I worked in this school. I need you to stand.
Go ahead, ma'am. My name is Dr. Melissa Borden, and I'm, a, I'm here today to talk about BD1 and Mrs. Andrews' desire to sever ties with the Florida School Board Association. I have a fear of public speaking. However, my love for my children and deep concern for their physical and emotional well-being helped me break through that fear and exercise my right of freedom of speech. It takes a lot of courage to stand up here before you and speak. We are protesting and speaking to protect our children. So what is your desire to sever ties from an or with an organization that is defending parental rights, not to mention freedom of speech, for the misguided concept of aligning with the National School Board Association? You rather align with an entity that labels concerned parents domestic terrorists. This is both concerning and disheartening. In the 1950s and 60s, brave parents exercised their right of freedom and speech and protested to desegregate schools. They fought for their children. They never gave up. Sadly, those parents today would have been labeled domestic terrorists. Think about that. In 1954, they defeated the school board. However, their fight continued. Other people continue to fight for their cause, be it reproductive freedoms, workplace tolerance, or lifestyle rights. Do you hate freedom or simply to show your bias of this cause? What you don't understand is that law-abiding parents like us are not driven by hate. Hate is a weak man's tool. We are driven by love. We are speaking out to protect our children out of love. Love is a much more powerful tool than hate. I will protect my children to the end of this earth. Do you want to align yourself with an organization that promotes hate and fear? An organization that calls parents love domestic terrorism? Or do you want to be on the side of tolerance, which you so freely call for in the public schools you are elected to re represent? Children need love, and you are working for the children. Parents' love for their children in the hero heroic fight for desegregation prevailed, and my daughter's beautiful, diverse group of friends can attest to that. The parents of today will prevail. The love will prevail. You will not, we will not stop the, until we won. Ms. Andrews, I call you to remove the discussion on severing ties with the Florida School Board Association and stand for love and not hate. If, in fact, it is the cause that, you, that has you on the wrong side of history here, we elected you to be a professional, free of bias and tolerance for discourse. We are capable, are you? Thank you. Emily Machiko, go ahead. Go ahead, ma'am. Hello, my name is Emily Machika. I'm in District 1. I came here last time, and now there are new topics. Um, but to speak on the agenda item of BRD, which is talking about appointing Mike Burke and foregoing the ability to find a better and more competent candidate. I object to that. And I think that it has been evident why that objection is there. I don't think there's any need to elaborate on that. And I also think that that attitude seems kind of contagious in the fact that last school board meeting, you guys made an absolute mockery of yourself by pretending to make an absolute mo mockery of us, the parents who were the ones who care about our kids. We don't care about you. We care about the fact that you are being an obstacle to our children's safety and education in which they are entitled to. It is a right, it is not a privilege. Your seat on that school board meeting, that is the privilege. And you need to understand that you serve us and it is not the other way around. So also in an agenda item is the uh, policy 1.03 in which you are trying to forgo your necessity to allow an accommodation, a reasonable accommodation for people to come here and to speak their mind so that you can understand the position of the people that you are meant to serve. So you trying to forgo the ability for people to leave tape recorded messages, I object that. Um, I had to wait almost an hour to get here because traffic was nuts. So that is not, again, a privilege. It is a right of us as American citizens to be able to speak our mind to you, our representatives, so that you can understand our position. And you need to understand that if you are not actually wanting to listen to parents and that this is such a horrible thing that you have to deal with, then 
It's this the phrase of, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. If you don't want, if you remove yourself as being an obstacle to our children and their education, then we would be fine. And this meeting could be filled with thanks and praises, but instead you are choosing to be an obstacle to our children. So if you do not wish to remove yourself as an obstacle from our children, then I think that you should just remove yourself from office and resign because you are not showing an appreciation for us. You are our servants and you need to be there for our children. Their education is declining. The graduation rates, the math rates, the reading rates are absolutely horrible. When are you guys going to show policies that are dictating the betterment of our children and their education instead of trying to protect us from something that you are bullying into us? Go ahead, ma'am, state your name. Hi, my name is Christina Manolis, and I was speaking about um, the subject POL GC1, which is about the school board meeting procedures. And I know you guys are trying to get rid of the right of us being able to come and speak. So I wanted to read to you a little bit from our First Amendment. We have the freedom of speech and the right to peacefully assemble and to petition a government or board like yourselves uh, to share our concerns, to protect our families and our freedom. This board was elected by the people and need to hear from us to know what's best for our children. If you don't hear from the parents, listen to our concerns and learn what's happening in schools each day, then you're not doing your job. What's sad is you all already made up your minds and you know what you're going to do regardless of what we say. So what is the point of showing up to these meetings? The point is because this is the United States of America. Many soldiers have died and lost their lives for me to be able to stand here and speak to you today. So I'm not gonna let that go in vain. And I want to encourage all the other parents out there that don't agree with things that are happening to come show up and network with the wonderful parents here and stand up for our rights to show our children firsthand to defend our freedom. So I have pulled out my children from Palm Beach County Schools to homeschool. But we all need to continue to come together and fight for our friends and family. I have so many friends whose children continue to go to school in Palm Beach County, and we should all unite and help one another. Because I don't care what political party you're with, I don't care if you're vaccinated or if you're unvaccinated, if you agree with masks or if you don't, we are in the United States of America and we have a freedom of choice. My kids asked me, my kids asked me if I had to leave to come to another school board meeting. I said, yes, I will do everything in my power to fight with the grace of God to protect you both and to ensure you grow up in a free country every chance that I get. My response was accepted with smiles and hugs. So I will stand up and fight for our freedoms, connect with other parents, and I encourage you to do the same. We will keep showing up in bigger and bigger numbers to show you all that we will not allow you to strip us of any more of our rights. And we have that given by God, not by any of you. Thank you and God bless America. What members, is there anything you'd like to pull from a, from the consent agenda? Seeing none, we need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, second by Mrs. Andrews. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. First item under new business, BRD1. I recommend the board rescind the prior vote to conduct a superintendent search and approve the appointment of Michael J. Burke as the superintendent of schools for the school district of Palm Beach County. Officers, they don't quiet down, just pick them out and make them leave. Need a motion? Motion by Dr. Robinson, seconded by Mrs. Andrews. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. BRD 2, I recommend the board approve the superintendent's employment agreement. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Dr. Robinson. Discussion? Ms. Ayala? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to get my two cents in here as we are making a decision I feel so proud of tonight. Um, I really can't overstate how fortunate we are to have a leader like Mike Burke at this moment in time. Let me tell you a little bit about what I've seen from him in the short time we've been working together. 
Um, a leader who is the first to arrive and the last to leave. A leader who actively participates in district events with our administrators, our teachers, and actually stays for the duration with nowhere he rapidly needs to escape to. A leader who listens and empowers those around him. A leader who with a steady hand and a focused determination to do what's best in the interest of our children. A leader who makes it a priority to attend events outside of the standard nine to five, or really for him, maybe seven to seven, to seven expectation of work. Um, after a long day on weekends with community organizations and to be present and be able to trust, uh, share with trusted partners our efforts to educate, affirm, and inspire the students of the school district of Palm Beach County. He really is the right leader at the right time, at the right place, and I fully support you in this role, Mr. Burke. We're all looking forward to you continuing to make us proud. Mrs. McQuinn. Two things in support of Mr. Burke as our superintendent. One most important is that when we were at a District 1 high school homecoming parade last Friday, teacher after teacher and the students unsolicited came to him and thanked him for, and thanked him for what he's doing. The other is, I am relaying. Officer, that one, whoever that was, they're out. They're out. Mr. Chair, I'm going to continue, and I will stop every time I'm interrupted. Go ahead, Ms. McQuinn. The other piece is that Mr. Talley, Dave Talley, who is a District 1 resident, sent word through our Inspector General, Gen, Inspector General Teresa Michael, that he could not be here tonight, but that he wants to share his support for Mr. Burke as our superintendent. Mr. Talley, as a District 1 community member, has long supported the schools in particularly District 1. He has served the entire district as a member and chair of our audit committee, and I take his recommendation very much to heart. Thank you. Vice Chairwoman Brew. Thank you. So I just want to share with everybody that Mr. Burke was the featured speaker today at the Coalition of Boynton West Residential Associations, and I have to tell you that the feedback that I received was absolutely wonderful. What was especially heartening was that when questions were asked, he spoke from the heart and answered them. And so I tried to give them some words before uh, Mr. Burke was on the, the, in the meeting describing him. And what came to mind immediately, we've heard it from others before, is that he's calm, soft-spoken, personable and kind, but he's also strong, decisive and knowledgeable. And kudos to you, Mr. Burke, for the fabulous team that you have put together. What I also find especially great in working with Mr. Burke is that he follows up with me when we meet each week on issues that we discussed the prior week and weeks before. His follow-up, his commitment, his commitment to roll up his sleeves and be a part of the community, a part of the classroom, to experience the jobs in the district is something that we haven't seen in a very long time and reminds me of Lawton Childs. So I just want to say thank you again because I think you are absolutely the right person in the right seat on the bus. Thank you. Mrs. Andrews. And thank you. And I said earlier, I'm so excited for this vote tonight for Mr. Burke, but I just want to reiterate uh, some things. When we uh, voted for Mr. Burke to be interim, and he was very willing to do it, since that time, I have seen him everywhere. And my district is one of the largest land uh, districts in, in this county. And uh, the people in Wellington, they've seen him on the ground at the last meeting when I just talked about the $400,000 the village of Wellington gave to the schools the meeting said, the people at the meeting said to Mr. Burke, you're the first one 
superintendent has been here to thank us for giving the $400,000 to the students, as well as the $3.4 million we've done over the years. You're the first superintendent that has done that. And just recently, Mr. Berg said, Ms. Andrews, I'll meet you at Canal Point Elementary School. And maybe some of you don't know where it's located, but it's the northwest part of Palm Beach County when you make the Palm Beach County line coming in to Palm Beach County. Mr. Burke met me out there at 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning to talk to the community about making a difference in a school that needed a lot of help. I just know I see him everywhere. I see him visiting schools and he has said to me, I'm committed, Ms. Andrews, to do whatever it takes to improve student achievement. And I know him because he's worked with me over the years. I'm excited to cast this vote tonight for Michael Burke, superintendent of schools. And as I heard the leaders of this community and people who know him best, they've reiterated what I'm saying. He's the man for the job right now to do it, to make Palm Beach County better than ever. And we're already a great county, but we're going to high heights with Michael Burke, superintendent of schools. Thank you. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. So <clears throat> I resisted the urge to speak at the last meeting. Um, and I was tempted not to say anything this time, but I, I also want to add um, my optimism um, and my expectation of change, you know? So Mr. Burke probably is not going to remember this, but some years ago, a principal in District 7 explained to me how the staffing formula was shortchanging the kids at his school. And I could not do an adequate job of, um, of sharing that message with Mr. Burke. And so he met me at the school. And the principal explained it to him and they looked at some, some data and some spreadsheets. And Mr. Burke came back and gave some additional units for reading at that school. And that impressed me because Mr. Burke has always known that the purpose of the dollars that he was watching for us and for you uh, was to educate children, right? And so, and the formula sometimes needed to be tweaked in order to do so. And so that's just one of many experiences that led me actually two superintendents ago to vote for Mr. Burke to be superintendent then, right? And I just realized recently, actually after watching him on one of these Sunday morning shows, that he had been, he's like a stealth agent or something. He had been sitting, I'm imagining, in hundreds of meetings with these career educators, listening, and he just turned right around and started answering questions about academics and social emotional learning and so forth that just truly impressed me. And it came naturally. It wasn't rehearsed. It was something he knows, right? And so I am really, really thrilled um, that we have um, Mr. Burke as our next superintendent. You know, People talk about having career educators as superintendent, but you know what? Like we've done that for a long time, right? And we have outcomes that I'm not at all pleased with, right? So yeah, if we want something different, let's do something different. And I'm ready. Let's go, Mr. Burke. All right, well, I guess I'll finish it up. I, you know, I was quoted in the paper saying there's no more, no one more qualified in this building to be the superintendent of this district, but I went on to say, and the reporter didn't report it, I don't believe there's any, anyone in this country that's more qualified to be superintendent of this district. Mr. Burke, you can keep the comments to yourself. Mr. Burke has the financial background. He's, he's managed the $4 billion budget of this district for years. Uh, Mr. Burke has sat in, as Dr. Robinson said, has sat in almost every academic meeting because Mr. Burke was responsible for funding those needs of, those ch of our children. Um, he's got what we probably wouldn't find anywhere. He's got both the academic and the financial background and the business background to lead this district. It's a $4 billion enterprise. We have 170,000 children that need his expertise 
and I think we've made the best decision we could possibly ever make in hiring Mr. Burke as the superintendent of Palm Beach County. With that said, we'll take a vote. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Congratulations, Superintendent Burke. You're our new superintendent. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to take non-agenda speakers now for half an hour from 7, 7.30, and then we'll get back to the rest of the agenda. I'll call you three at a time, Michelle Mitchell, Gilma, Gleema Mitchell, and Adam LaPierre, Pierre, I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly. Please come up to, the, to one of the microphones. <laughs> Shlamet Kadash, Michael Lefebvre, Karen Moran. Go ahead, ma'am. Hello, my name is Karen Moran. I'm a former teacher in Palm Beach County. I'm with Save Our Schools America at gmail.com. I'm concerned about the mental health of the children and youth in Palm Beach County. I'm concerned that they're being taught negative thoughts and ideas that can cause hopelessness and depression. Teaching children that they are oppressed or that they are the oppressor through the 1619 Project, critical race theory or equity or whatever you wanna call it. I believe these teachings are not healthy for any children. I believe the children need to be taught positive values and positive thoughts that will lift their spirits and heal their minds from hopelessness. Many children and youth are committing suicide or harming themselves because they have no hope. They see no future. In the Bible in Jeremiah 29, 11, it says that God has a plan for each and every one of them. It says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. It also teaches them that God loves them unconditionally, red, brown, yellow, black, or white. They're all precious in his sight. It even says in Psalm 139, 16, that they're fearfully and wonderfully made and that God had a plan for their lives before they were even born. And all the days of their life were written in a book in heaven with their name on it before they were even born. These are the kind of thoughts that these children need to hear about their mental health. One of my other concerns is that we're wasting time singling out a different group almost every month to emphasize and, and bring to the forefront. This month, I understand that you're declaring October LGBTQ plus month. Meanwhile, the academics in Palm Beach County is suffering, whether they say that they're in A school or not, most of the children graduating barely can read or do math. They have a less chance to go to college or succeed. So I beg you, please consider your course of action. Reconsider the types of things these children are being taught and the amount of time and effort being put into all these other things. If you're gonna teach history, teach true American history and civics of our nation, and not that we are a racist country founded on the backs of slaves. Parents want their children to be taught to love their country, not hate it, and not be ashamed of it. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Thank you. Carol Byers, Grace Greenberg, Cindy Falco. Go ahead, ma'am. Hello, my name is Grace Greenberg. I wonder if Jesus died in vain, especially when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. 2,000 years later, I heard testimonials from Israelis, the most vaccine compliant nation. 
people of all ages who have survived with serious long-term conditions, and from those who have uh, had lost loved ones within 24 to 48 hours of receiving the shots, and or who fought the battle and lost the vaccines and not necessarily the virus. The conclusion from firsthand recipients, most would choose not to take the shot if they could trade out their permanently debilita debilitating effects of myocarditis, thrombus, ischemic, uh, ischemic disorders, Bell's palsy, pervasive developmental disorders, personality disorders, and learning disabilities. Of course, there are medications to take for the rest of their lives. Testing vaccines is evaluated over years for adverse effects that come over time. We have rushed out of fear from propaganda to reach masses all over the world. Because the federal government has contracts with public and private sectors, providing bribes with your tax dollars for all employees to get the jab and bribing children with scholarships. And of course, one pays nothing for these shots. Schools are forced to take their medicine or lose money. No questions asked, nor reservations, because the government says it's safe and effective. This plan to inoculate children has been in place for a very long time. Masks won't be necessary then. Biden is not looking for herd immunity, but compliant herd mentality. That is why dissenters like us have put our lives on the line to speak and be heard. The mandate for vaccines is an act of premeditated murder. You do not know the true consequences of this DNA altering serum, yet you are willing to condone the mass inoculation. And now more boosters every year, every year. Here is a stock tip, invest in big pharma. You can't go wrong in making money there. Parents, shame on you. Will your children be sterile and not give you grandchildren or become pharmaceutical dependent victims? After all, big pharma wins big either way. Jesus might say, what is it going to take to wake up? If not taking away your freedoms one by one, how about taking away your children, your pride and joy, and the heart of the future? Father, must we allow them to not question what they do? After all, they have free will, but not to infringe on others' rights to live or die. No to vaccines, period. Get them off this campus. Go ahead. After hearing that, and my mother who does live in Israel, and what they have done to so many people, even my mother's friends, and they target you, the elderly, they target you, those who have darker skin than me, and they target, uh, target the Hispanics. There is a plan, my friends, and you need to hear this clearly, and it is to eliminate you. This whole scam, pandemic, and this biochemical warfare, if you don't know, it does have a patent number. So what that means is when you freely, because see, they can't really make you take it, but they let you be in fear so that you're willing to take it. There's a difference and you do have a choice, but are you willing to stand up? I'm gonna go back to my story before I change the subject. So here we have the vaccine that you are putting in people's bodies. Do you know that in that vaccine, as I said, it is a patented drug that they're put together that was made in a lab with a number on it. And once you get that into your body, you do not any longer have sovereignty. You are owned because somebody has a patent number on something that's inside of you. This is how important this is that you need to understand this. And I know that so many of you have heard about the mark of the beast in the, New, in the New Testament and Revelation. Well, this is a forerunner to the mark of the beast. Okay, because it might not be putting on your right hand or your forehead, so you're misconstruing what it looks like and seems like. But this is a forte to the mark of the beast. And if you take this, you're basically saying to God Almighty, you don't trust him, that you trust in this government as God instead of God himself. And he's grieved with that. And I'm going to ask you to repent and ask God to forgive you because he will. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you might be healed from it. But at least you made a wrong right at this point. But I'm asking you, any one of you that tells me that you are a believer in Yeshua, my Jewish Judeo-Christian friends, and you are participating in this communism that's going on, this Nuremberg Code, because there is absolutely, never will be, any way that this will be a documented virus, because what this is is a biochemical warfare. And as soon as they turn on that 5G, 
your body is going to have responses that are going to be uncontrollable by you because you have nano parts in your body, in your temple, in the temple that you said that you gave to God. See, you don't have a right to cover your face. You don't have a right when you gave your life to Jesus Christ to put that junk into your temple. Because when you gave your life to him, you are your own. He owned you. And he gives us free will. And that's the beauty of it. Not like this government who thinks they own you and they don't. And they're trying to be God over you. And they're trying to cause you to go into submission and to shut up and, and not say anything. Let this continue. I'm saying to you people, wake up, do your due diligence, go to frontlinedoctors.org, look it up, do your homework. Thank you. Edward Niesenbaum, Sandy Sullivan, Angelique Contreras. Go ahead, ma'am. Uh, hello, my name is Edward and I'm a fifth grader. It's Hello, my name is Edward and I'm a fifth grader. It's very difficult to sit in class for five hours in a mask. I start having headaches and my doctor t told me that masking was changing, damaging my health. Do you care? My governor DeSantis cares. He signed an executive order against mask mandates. You had your time in court and you lost. My message for you are stop breaking the laws, being bullies, and start caring about us. I have another favor to ask. I've been in school for two months and didn't have a single language or arts lesson. I didn't write any essays and didn't learn a single new or word. My teacher forced by you to teach me liberal political stuff. I've been introduced to a bridge united declaration of human rights, which was not even a bridge correctly. We are learning how fictional characters from 1920s experience human right violations. Dear BEO members, United Nations was created after World War II, and Declaration was introduced in 1948. Did you know that? I wanted to point out number 25. Everybody has a right to good house? Really? Anybody should work hard in order to buy a house. Any fifth grader knows this. This is Bernie Sanders' liber liberal political propaganda. Please remove politics from schools. We don't need your parenting. We have parents, church, synagogues, and masks. Don't use parents' tax money for a subject called guidance, another way of your propaganda. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you want children to be uneducated into, in order to easily manipulate us. I'm not going to stay home and play games. I will volunteer for a new BO candidate who will protect us. Uh, Jen Schultwater and Angela Confira. I'm already volunteering for my future congressman, Jeff Mangiorno. Mr. Frank Burberry Jr., my board member, you stated on the news that you were threatened by parents. My parents didn't threaten you. But you, with your mandates and curriculum, are threatening my future. And the last one, return Columbus Day to our schools. Do not rewrite American history. Last, last, last one. Courage is contagious. Be the bravest. Bye. Go ahead, ma'am. State your name. Thank you, sir. My name is Sandy Sullivan. Marcia Andrews is serving her membership with the Florida School Board Association. No reason listed. Could it be because Florida SBA, along with those in Louisiana, Virginia, and are trying to distance themselves from the National Association? All saying the national group didn't consult them with before issuing the letter asking to label concerned parents who speak at board members as domestic terrorists requested FBI investigations. Yet I don't hear her distancing herself from the source of this controversy, the NSBA. Interesting. The board feels threatened because their ability to do whatever they want is over. The people are reclaiming their rightful place as main decision makers for themselves and their children. Such as they, as such, they want to be heard, respected, and told the truth. The citizens were told that the board used 
use a process to find a permanent super like hiring a headhunter and having community meetings for input. Mass emails calls, calls physical public speakers stated that they want to participate, yet you voted without discussion to upgrade Burke to interim and now full super. You talked about Bullying Prevention Month and Disability History Awareness Month, yet you're voting in persons the people don't want, who bullies the staff and students and deny special need kids medical exemptions. Let, let's not forget the board itself is violating a multiple, multitude of laws, including but not limited to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 1991 Rehab Act of 1973, Section 2302, Title V of the United States Code, OSHA, ADA, Florida State Constitution and Laws Articles, Florida Statues and Florida Statues. You have not demonstrated nor acted in a responsible, necessary, or narrowing, tailored way. Sorry. Um, there are other ways. The FDA discovered the PCR test has massive positive rates and it's failed to full review. All vaccines in use are EU. I was reading this um, for Jen Showalter, who you did not allow to read previously. <laughs> You have Holocaust Education Week, yet you ignore Nurburn Code's uh, lessons learned. Thank Thumbs you up, for your time. Hello, board. Angela Contreras. If the public school buildings were on fire and your children or grandchildren were inside, what would be the appropriate response? It would be to get them out immediately. Any parent knows the correct response would be to run into the burning building as quickly as possible, regardless of the risk. Rescue the children, run back out, and get as far as possible from the deadly blaze. The lives in the future of our children are on the line. After all, the school buildings are not physically burning down. But what is happening inside their walls is endangering our children. I'd like to clarify that this school board cannot legally obstruct our sovereign rights to choose our children's education and health care needs. However, this board has continued to go against Florida state law and the Parents' Bill of Rights, robbing us of that autonomy. This is, in fact, dangerous and irresponsible. Decisions made by this board do not outweigh our personal responsibility to protect our children from your rash and unlawful mandates. I'd like to also clarify that this governing body is not a legislative body. You do not make laws. You do not have the power to take away our rights and you do not have the final say. Palm Beach County School Board, I'm imploring you to take immediate action and do everything in your capacity as a board to restore our parental rights. If you do not, we will continue to take action against this board legally and make sure that your seats are filled with elected officials who will uphold and respect our individual rights and liberties. It is time to get back to the overall education of our children and not indoctrination and bullying. I want to add more to that. We continue to show up at these board meetings. I can say that, yes, we appreciate the fact that we have the rights to show up here and that you're privileged to be sitting in those seats. If any of those words sounded familiar, it was because a letter from Ayala to Secretary Cardona stated some of these words, that you have a sovereign right, that you as a board are legislators, and I wanted to clarify that you are not legislators, that you do not have the right to take away our parental rights and continue doing the things that you have been doing to us for the past 
year and a half. We will continue to show up, we will continue to speak out, and we will continue to be vocal for our children's future. Beverly Becker, Allison Rampersad, Christina Manali. Go ahead, ma'am, state your name. Hello, my name is Christina Manolis, and I would like to take this opportunity of free speech to connect and send a message out to all the parents to let them know what I've learned here attending these meetings um, that has completely shocked me. Did you know that aside from masks being mandated on our children, that they are being taught in school that there are more than two genders? You can choose what you are by how you feel. And that's actually a part of the lesson kids are learning today in school. If this doesn't sit well with you, you're not alone. This goes against our faith and our morals, but it's okay to teach our children? I don't think so. Did you know that Bibles are not allowed in school, but are encouraged in prisons? Maybe it's time we switch that around, guys. Teachers can hang LGBTQ class, uh, flags in class, Black Lives Matters, and brainwash your children of their views and beliefs but to keep faith and religion out of schools, it's not acceptable. If we believe all lives matter, we are no good. Enough is enough. We should show love and kindness to others, regardless of their color, political party, if you're gay, if you're straight. I want to teach my children to show you God's love. Stop letting them divide us. We want to show love and to support to one another, but it needs to be loving all around and not just certain people's views. Back to homeschooling. I never thought I was smart enough or I had the patience to homeschool. And quite frankly, I didn't think my kids would listen to me when it's so hard just to get out the door sometimes. But trust me, they will. But I've been pleasantly surprised to say the least. We can cuddle and do reading, travel and do school on the road. I can teach them about the Declaration of Independence. I can teach them about God and his almighty grace and I can be the main influence in my children's life all while maintaining a great social life by playing sports, being involved in the huge homeschool community that is so embracing and wonderful, and we even do marine biology class on the beach. We are living the good life, and I am so thankful I was pushed to homeschooling. Life doesn't get better than this. Everyone, you're going to feel overwhelmed and think that you can't do it, but I'm here to tell you that you can and there's a huge network of parents that are here to help you. I have friends that homeschool and are also full-time um, workers. So there is a way, and um, you don't need to send your kids to school if you don't agree with the things that they are being taught. So again, thank you for listening. And again, I just want to urge parents who don't feel comfortable with what's happening in schools that you can homeschool. If you're keeping your kids in school, please, please come out to these meetings and let's show them by the numbers that we can unite and protect our children. Thank you, and God bless America. Danielle Underwood, Arabia Bradford, Khalil Bradford. Dear board and superintendent, my name is Danielle, and tonight I'm here to speak for all the people, to all the people in this room and all those that are watching, to our governor and all the elected officials, and to anyone who has a heart and cares about the children in these schools. We the parents, we the people have a right to hold the board accountable. As our governor stated today, we have a right and we will hold you accountable. What you are doing is the most inhumane and disgusting thing. As we all know, I am an advocate for special need kiddos. Every child is unique in their own way, and every parent has a right called the, the Parental Bill of Rights in Florida. They have a right to make a decision for their children's education and safety and well-being. This bill is actually a Florida state law. Now let me educate you on what a law is. A law is a system of rules which are recognized and enforced by penalties. Now to give an example, child abuse. Child abuse is physical, sexual, or psychological maltreatment of a child. 
The penalty can be an arrest and put through the judicial system. One more example, stealing. You stole something from a store. The penalty would be an arrest and put through the judicial system. So now tell me, why do you feel that you can break the law and be above the law? Now on to our ESE students and student mask exemptions. You guys have policies and procedures for student mask exemptions. How is it that the parents don't or aren't given an opportunity to a 504 meeting when they have a diagnosis and a doctor's note? By law, yes, that key word, law. A 504 meeting under the Civil Rights Act of 504, parents are able to have a team meeting to analyze all the data and have the participating members come to a team decision on what the child needs. Here in Palm Beach County, people are being straight up denied a meeting. They're period, no meeting. They're not giving a 504 meeting. They're being told, nope, your documentation stinks, you can't have a meeting. These are children with disabilities. To disregard their parents' doctor's notes and their right to a 504 meeting is against the law. You cannot do it. You can hold a meeting and have your team at the meeting and decide that the child doesn't meet the mask exemptions, but you cannot withhold them from having a 504 meeting. So stop doing it, because the next thing that's going to happen is a lawsuit slapped on every single one of your desks, personally and through the district. We are not stopping here. You cannot deny a disabled person the right to a fair meeting to decide whether or not a mask exemption is needed. Did we understand and comprehend that? You cannot deny them the right to a 504 or IEP meeting. The governor is well aware. The legal department at the State Department of Education is well aware of what's going on. I got off the phone with them today. I will take every minute of my day to report each and every single school that Um, hello, my name is Khalil Bradford, and um, I'm a student at Palm Beach Lakes um, High School. And um, this is for Dr. Robinson in District 7. Um, recently, on October 4th, an incident took place with me and a football coach at Palm Beach Lake High School, where this incident had me kicked off the football team for the remainder of my senior year in high school. It was a remainder of four games left, and that was taken from me by um, David Alfonso. This incident involved a coach picking up a brick, threatening me, and um, I did not do, I'm not saying that I did not do anything wrong, but I feel like this this punishment was extremely excessive. Um, I have already set out one game while the entire incident was under investigation. During the investigation, our principal, David Alfonso, had me feel as though he did not take the situation as serious as I thought he would when I reported it. I tried to approach Mr. Alfonso multiple times during different occasions, including emails. It took him several days to even have a word with me. And when he did have a word with me, I felt like our conversation was rough. It was rushed and brief. Um, I thought that I did all the right things by reporting him. And when I tried to approach him and report it, the situation to him, um, I felt like that he was just like shrugging it off his shoulders. Um, this incident, me being kicked off the football team, it has dropped my mental health. I'm having problems like in class because everybody's coming up to me asking me what's going on. It's just like a lot to bury. And it was four games left. Like, and my, I'm trying to get a scholarship, and I feel like this is just excessive for him to kick me off of the team. And um, go ahead. And also, when I tried to report it going to the school, I was escorted off the off the campus by an officer. I wasn't being belligerent or anything. Um, I told him I emailed several people about this incident. We don't know. We didn't know where to go. And uh, he is a 504. And by you know, he emailed me back and said he wasn't a 504. And we have records. They have records. I got the records from the counselor. And it just, everything has just been crazy amongst what's going on. Just my, my son, he's standing up and he reported it. You, he reported it and he's been reprimanded. They didn't report it. They're trying to cover it up because it's a good old boy system, you know, and, and enough is enough. And all we, we want is just justice 
for him in his senior year. This is for him to get a scholarship. He came to live with me from Texas. He came a long way. For him to just them to just kick him off. No one is called. No one has tried to talk to him. No one's tried to reach out to him about any of this. And this is just unjust. This is like worse than the judicial system. They're just kicking them, just doing away with them. And that's why we're here today to find out some justice. And we're, that's just what it is. Mr. Superintendent, COM1. I recommend the board proclaim October 2021 as National Bullying Prevention and Awareness Month. Motion by Ms. Ayala. Officers. Ms. Ayala, seconded by Mrs. Andrews. Who's reading that? Excuse me. I registered to speak here. I'll get to you. I'll, I'll get to you. I'll get to you, sir. Yes, sir. If your name's on the list, I'll get to you. Sir, yep. Yes, it's on there. It? Yep. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Proclamation, National Bullying Prevention and Awareness Month, October 2021. Whereas bullying is physical, verbal, sexual, or emotional harm or intimidation intentionally directed at a person or group of people, and whereas bullying occurs in neighborhoods, playgrounds, schools, and through technology, such as the internet and cell phones, and whereas various researchers have concluded that bullying is the most common form of violence affecting millions of American children and adolescents annually, and whereas thousands of children and adolescents nationally are affected by bullying annually, and whereas Targets of bullying are more likely to acquire physical, emotional, and learning problems, and students who are repeatedly bullied often fear such activities such as riding the bus, going to school, and attending community activities, and whereas children who are bullied are at a greater risk of engaging in more serious violent behaviors, and whereas children who witness bullying often feel less secure, more fearful, and intimidated, now, therefore, it be resolved that the superintendent and school board of Palm Beach County do hereby proclaim October 2021 as National Bullying Prevention and Awareness Month, and be it further resolved that in Palm Beach County schools, every employee, student, parent, guardian, volunteer, recreation program, and community organization make a conscious effort and commitment not to add to the pain of others and to do our best to look at people with caring eyes and serve as an ally to all those in need, that everyone be encouraged to engage in a variety of awareness and prevention activities designed to make our learning environments and communities safer for all children and adolescents done this 20th day of October 2021 in West Palm Beach, Florida. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. COM2, Mr. Superintendent. Yes. I recommend the board proclaim October 28, 2021 as lights on after school day. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Mrs. Andrews. Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you. Proclamation, lights on after school, October 28, 2021. Whereas the school district of Palm Beach County stands firmly committed to quality after school programs and opportunities because they provide safe, challenging, engaging, and fun learning experiences to help children and youth develop their social, emotional, physical, cultural, and academic skills, support working families by ensuring their children are safe, productive, and the af after the regular school day ends, build stronger communities by involving our students, parents, business leaders, and adult volunteers in the lives of our young people, thereby promoting positive relationships among children, youth, families, and adults, engage families, schools, and diverse community partners in advancing the welfare of our children, and whereas the Department of Extended Learning and Primetime Palm Beach County Incorporated have provided significant leadership in the area of community involvement in et the education and well-being of our youth, grounded in the principle that quality after-school programs are key to helping our children become successful adults 
And whereas Lights On After School is a national celebration of after school programs, promotes the critical importance of quality after school programs in the lives of children, their families, and their communities, and whereas 10.2 million children and youth are enrolled in after school programs nationwide, 19.4 million more would participate if programs were available, and Whereas many after school programs across the country are facing funding shortfalls so severe that they are being forced to close their doors and turn off their lights. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the superintendent and the school board of Palm Beach County do hereby proclaim October 28th, 2021 as lights on after school day and urges the citizens of Palm Beach County to ensure every child has access to a safe, engaging place where the lights are on after school. And be it further resolved that the superintendent and the school board enthusiastically endorse lights on after school and are committed to innovative after school programs and activities that ensure lights stay on and the doors stay open for all children after school. Done this 20th day of October 2021 in West Palm Beach, Florida. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Sue M3, Mr. Superintendent. I recommend the board proclaim October 2021 as LGP. LGBTQ plus History Month. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Ms. Ayala. Mrs. Andrews. Thank you. Proclamation LGBTQ plus History Month, October 2021. Whereas lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning LGBTQ plus Americans have made and continue to make great and lasting contributions that continue to strengthen the fabric of American society. And whereas LGBTQ plus History Month reminds both the LGBTQ plus and wider communities of important roles LGBTQ plus people have taken in creating the social, legal, and political worlds we live in today. And whereas this month, as we recognize the immeasurable contributions of LGBTQ plus Americans, we renew our commitment to the struggle for equity and equal rights for LGBTQ plus students and staff. And whereas the school district of Palm Beach County is committed to academic success of all youth and to removing barriers to that end. And we believe that LGBTQ plus youth should feel safe to learn without the fear of harassment or discrimination. Whereas LGBTQ plus educators, students, and families should be supported to live an affirmative life with dignity and respect. And whereas the LGBTQ plus community cuts across every demographic of race, gender, economic status, ethnicity, religion, and region. And whereas the school district of Palm Beach County has taken appropriate measures to address LGBTQ plus bullying, harassment, and educational equity in general through non-discriminatory policy 5.001, anti-bullying policy 5.002, equity policy 1.041, and other policies. And whereas community-based organizations and community leaders have partnered with the school district of Palm Beach County to educate, support, and provide resources to promote safe learning environments for all students and families. Whereas the school district of Palm Beach County appreciates and recognizes the importance of LGBTQ plus history month and as an effective measure of educating and calling to action the citizens of Palm Beach County to work together to promote equal protection of all Palm Beach County students, staff, regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the superintendent and school board of Palm Beach County do hereby proclaim October 2021 as LGBTQ plus History Month, done this 20th day of October 2021 in West Palm Beach, Florida. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. COM 4, Mr. Superintendent. I recommend the board proclaim November 8th through November 12th, 2021 as Holocaust Education Week. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by 
Mrs. Whitfield, Ms. Brew. Thank you. So this is the proclamation for Holocaust Education Week, November 8 to 12, 2021. Whereas the Florida Department of Education has designated the second week of November as Holocaust Education Week. Holocaust Education Week has been set aside by the state of Florida and the school district of Palm Beach County to remember the victims of the Holocaust, as well as to reflect on the need for respect of all peoples. And whereas the Holocaust was the state-sponsored systemic persecution and annihilation of European Jewry by Nazi Germany and its collaborators between 1933 and 1945. Six million Jews were murdered. Roma, gypsies, people with disabilities, and Poles were also targeted for destruction or dissemination for racial, ethnic, or national reasons. Millions more, including homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses, Soviet prisoners of war, and political dissidents also suffered grievous oppression and death under Nazi tyranny. And whereas the history of the Holocaust offers an opportunity to reflect on the moral responsibilities of individuals, societies, and governments. And whereas the school district of Palm Beach County should always remember the terrible events of the Holocaust and remain vigilant against hatred, persecution, and tyranny. And whereas the school district of Palm Beach County should actively rededicate itself to the principles of individual freedom and a just society. And whereas November 9th, 2021, marks the 83rd anniversary of Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. And whereas during Kristallnacht, hundreds of synagogues in Germany and Austria were burned and destroyed. Businesses and homes were ransacked. Scores of innocent Jews were killed and thousands of others were arrested and sent to concentration camps. And whereas Kristallnacht serves as a prelude to the Holocaust and to the systemic mass murder on a scale never before seen in human history. And whereas the reign of the Nazi government marks one of the darkest periods in civilized history. Where, and whereas the commemoration of this unprecedented event reminds us all of our solemn duty to keep alive the memory of the millions who perished during the Holocaust and to ensure through education and mutual respect that acts of genocide shall never again occur. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the superintendent and the school board of Palm Beach County do hereby proclaim the week of Monday, November 8th, through Friday, November 12, 2021, as Holocaust Education Week in memory of the victims of the Holocaust and in honor of the survivors, as well as the rescuers and liberators, and further proclaim that we should work to promote human dignity and confront hate whenever and wherever it occurs. Done this 20th day of October, 2021, in West Palm Beach, Florida. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. COM 5, Mr. Superintendent. I recommend the board proclaim October 2021 as Disability History and Awareness Month. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Mrs. Whitfield, Ms. Brill. And so this is the proclamation for Disability History and Awareness Month, October 2021. Whereas the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, Public Law 94-142 of 1975, and the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, of 1997, and the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, of 1990, were signed into law to promote access to schools and communities for individuals with disabilities. And whereas these pieces of legislation caused schools, communities, and workplaces to become more inclusive and welcoming for individuals with disabilities. And whereas in 2008, the Florida legislature designated the first two weeks in October as Disability History and Awareness Weeks. And whereas National Disability Employment Awareness Month is held each October to celebrate the many contributions of individuals with disabilities to our workplaces and economy. And whereas Down Syndrome Awareness Month 
reminds us to see people as individuals first. And whereas National Dyslexia Awareness Month was first celebrated in October 2002, and whereas by improving literacy proficiency for those with language-based learning disabilities, we improve their success throughout their school and adult experiences. And whereas, all individuals, including individuals with disabilities, require access to communities and employment opportunities. And whereas, individuals with disabilities are individuals first and foremost, with unique strengths and abilities. And whereas, there should not be any barriers to participation for individuals with disabilities in order to unlock their vast possibilities so that they may achieve their greatest potential for happy and productive lives within their communities. And whereas, the School Board of Palm Beach County prides itself on being student-centered and where our community, schools and communities are committed to providing programs that meet the diverse needs of all students. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the superintendent and school board of Palm Beach County do hereby proclaim October 2021 as Disability History and Awareness Month and urges all personnel and students to participate in disability history and awareness activities in order to celebrate the contributions of individuals with disabilities. Done this 20th day of October 2021 in West Palm Beach, Florida. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Yeah. Officers, Four. one more time, and the officer's going to remove you. If you want to talk, go outside. LR1. I recommend the board approve the attached MOU with the Association of Education Secretaries and Office Personnel known as ASOP, and authorize the superintendent or designee to sign all documents and contracts related to the agreement which are required for implementation. Motion by Mrs. Woodfield, seconded by Dr. Robinson. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. LR2. I recommend the board approve the attached memorandum of understanding with Service Employees International Union, Florida Public Service Union, known as SEIU slash FPSU and authorize the superintendent or designee to sign all documents and contracts related to the agreement which are required for implementation. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Dr. Robinson. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. P2. I recommend the board approve the personnel addendum as submitted. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Ms. Ayala. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. P3. I, rec yep. I recommend the board approve personnel addendum number two as submitted. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Mrs. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. It'll take us back to the non-agenda speakers. I'll call you three at a time. Please come up to the microphone that's closest to you. Fiona Lachelles, Bailey Lachelles, Melissa Martz. Can someone pull that microphone down for her, please? Hi, I'm, I am Fiona. Go ahead. We can hear you. Hi, I am Fiona in Discovery Key Elementary, and I and I have been suspended for 27 days. And I'm still going to stand up for what I believe in, but I'm going to respect other people's time. Very good. Go ahead, ma'am. State your name. Bailey Lachelles. Um, since Jen Schulwater can't finish this, I'm going to go ahead and wrap that up for her. You have Holocaust Education Week, yet ignore the Nuremberg Code and the lessons learned from the horrific attack on the Jewish people, disabled and dissenters. We understand the danger of state-sanctioned incitement demonizing, segregating, labeling and harassing of specific groups, like the unmasked and unvaccinated, 
or of the concerned parent, or the concerned parent, sorry. The Holocaust taught us the danger of silence, the consequences of indifference, and the responsibility to protect. Parents no longer will be silent. They now understand their responsibility as well as the responsibility to talk truth, to power, and to protect the vulnerable. I'm also, like my daughter, going to show a little bit of respect for the people that are still here who haven't left through your games and tactics of thinking that we're not going to stay here to speak to you. Because, Mr. Burke, that's not how it's going to work. We're still here, and we're still going to fight this with you. Go ahead, ma'am. In the other room, go ahead. Good evening. My name is Melissa Martz. I am an attorney, a child advocate, and I am a mom for liberty. My message tonight it remains for the powerful law-abiding parents and not the law-breaking criminals sitting at the dais. Parents, this elected school board has more than failed us and our children. They have failed us in academia by choosing to teach topics outside of their given authority, topics like CRT and equity, while at the same time neglecting the thesis of what they are hired to do, to teach reading, uh, to teach reading, writing, and math. Current stats for Palm Beach County School Board show a high school graduation rate of 74.9%. Test scores showed proficiency in math at the elementary, middle school, and high school levels ranging from 47 to 63%, and reading 49 to 55%. Yet, this school board took in $2,354,794,000 of our taxpayer money. If any of us failed at our jobs in this way, we would be fired. This board has been offered money by the federal government through the SAFE program under the U.S. Department of Education. And that is why they don't care that our governor withholds their salaries for their illegal and abusive mask mandate. Our federal government is breaking the law with them. Parents, there is a U.S. bill right now to abolish the unconstitutional U.S. Department of Education. Call your U.S. congressional representatives and demand that they support it. I also want to add that I spoke with a parent today that feels their sick child is safer testing away from unmasked children. These students also deserve to be accommodated per the ADA statute. One size does not fit all. I am also concerned about this board's knowledge concerning child sex trafficking. I have been an anti-child sex trafficking advocate for the last several years. Victims should not be masked because it impedes identification, and masking a child that suffers with PTSD from child sexual exploitation um, is insane. And I should know because this is one of the reasons that I myself am not able to wear a mask. Lastly, this board says they care about minorities, yet they are currently being sued for baker axing and handcuffing numerous children as young as five years old without parental consent. Shockingly, these children are disproportionately black and disabled. Maybe Ms. Postal would like to help with this. The, pl <laughs> the plan of this board is clearly to vaccinate our children at school. If they will baker act your child without your consent, what makes you think they won't vaccinate them without your consent? Parents, you hold the power. There is support in our community and in our legislation to remove your children from these schools, to place them in private schools, co-ops, or homeschooling. The time is now. We the people free the people. Yes. Melissa Borden, Sherry Ackerley, Roberto, Roberto Rossetto. Melissa Borden, Sherry Ackerley, and Robert Rossetto. Thank you. I'm Robert Rossetto. Keep your mask up, sir. Palm Beach County is no longer under a state of emergency related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Because of the improving state of coronavirus cases and hospitalizations locally, county commissioners voted unanimously yesterday to end Palm Beach County's latest state of emergency, which had been in effect since August 17th. It's now time for you to terminate the mask mandate and don't even think about issuing vaccine mandates, especially without medical and religious exemptions. Children are not at high risk, and the excuse of ma masking them to protect the adults is no longer valid. Everyone who has wanted the vaccine has already had the opportunity to get it. In fact, over 80% of Florida adults are vaccinated, which is slightly higher than the national percentage. As of today, per the CDC, in all of 2020 and 2021, there are 48 children from ages 0 to 17 that have died in Florida involving COVID-19. Now, 48 children deaths may seem too high, and I recognize any child's death is unfortunate. 
But having said that, there have been 3,853 deaths in Florida during the same time for the same age children of 0 to 17, 77 of which are from pneumonia alone. What are we doing about the thousands of deaths that aren't COVID-related? Only 48 out of 3,853 deaths are COVID-related. Why is COVID, COVID, COVID all we hear? Now, I commend the Florida School Boards Association, not you guys, the Florida School Boards Association, that said they will reject FBI intervention at our local school board meetings. Unfortunately, I don't think everyone, including the FBI that seems to be here, got that memo because of the current administration and our media like to talk about parents like us as domestic terrorists. Fake news is trying to scare parents from speaking up at these meetings, but we realize there is nothing to fear and we will not be silenced. Let me assure you we are not terrorizing any one of you and that we have the freedom to speak up. We are promising you that your positions are at risk and that you will be removed and replaced. But let's be clear that out of everyone here, that you, the members on this board, are the only ones terrorizing children by forcing our teachers and principals to enforce your illegal mandates and go against our state law. I understand you might feel uncomfortable with all of us here and you might not like what we have to say, but we are here to challenge your policies and not terrorize you. We have realized you are the problem and we will not surrender until the problem has been dealt with appropriately. Either stand up and do what is right for us and the children or suffer the consequences of your careers ending and whatever legal action may be taken against you. Don't forget you work, don't forget you work for us and what your duties are. We will see this through and we will prevail. These mask mandates aren't about science. They aren't about children or staff health. They clearly are political. And on that note, I'm going to say, let's go, Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Kayla Drick, Edward Dolezal, Lorraine Abbey Kitsev. Go ahead, ma'am. Good evening. Name? My name is Kayla Drick. I'm a parent in District 5. I come again to this meeting to speak up for my daughter. Her education suffers yet. Again, as your pursuit of ending up on the paid side of politics is found to be more important than providing quality education for our children. A few weeks back, my child was found deficient in phonological awareness. How could I expect her to hear the words properly when her teacher is speaking? I'll continue to work at home with her on her phonolo phonology, as it's evident you have no plans to reevaluate the illegal mask mandate that you set forth. Despite the latest developments of our county dropping its COVID-19 state of emergency order, I'll also continue to investigate alternative schooling options as it's clear that you have an agenda to stick with, one that doesn't include the betterment of our children. Parents, I ask you something tonight. Please inquire to your school about something called social emotional learning. I discovered that my daughter and her class are being sent to a guidance counselor each week and are being forced to reveal private thoughts and feelings about themselves, among other harmful things, that sounds a whole lot like repackaged critical race theory. The school district has no right to play doctor in the classroom. Regardless of the guidance counselor's degree, neither myself nor her father signed a consent form for medical treatment, nor does she need it. I will be addressing this matter in a more official channel. Again, parents, write to your principals, Talk to your children. It's called social emotional learning, and the underbelly of it is critical race theory, which is illegal in Florida, okay? My daughter does not need to be told that she's different from other students because of her race, ever. No student should be told that. Now she's asking me questions that I would never thought I'd have to answer to a seven-year-old. Separately, I'd like to discuss the standardized testing scores and proficiency levels of Palm Beach County. Parents must realize that a student now only needs to score 62% or higher to achieve an A in their class. And that our proficiency levels never top 63%. Some of the other schools in Palm Beach County are even scoring less than 20% proficiency in reading. And having only fallen lower to, due to the COVID-19 protocols, not COVID-19, but the protocols you have set in place. Comparing this to the standard of which most parents were graded on when they went to school, Almost all of our children are failing, mine included. 
a fact that they've attempted to hide in a curved grading metric and an endless focus on equity. Looking back on the last 10 years of school improvement plans for my daughter's school, I noticed that you've divided results based on race the entire time. Unfortunately, it's done nothing to help the students. Minority grades continue to fall behind, more so now than ever. I'd like to see you change course and stop your relentless goals of injecting racism into our schools and furthermore deem it Go ahead, the gentleman in the other room, go ahead. State your name, please. Uh, hey, good evening. Uh, my name is Ed Dolezal, and uh, this is my seventh time here. So unless things change, you can expect me to, you can expect to see me here again. Um, you as a board are in violation of your oaths of office as previously outlined in earlier meetings that which I attended. Uh, furthermore, you did not consult with parents nor obtain their consent as required in the org chart about hiring the new superintendent. So here is the org chart at the very top. As you can see, it says students, parents, and community of Palm Beach County. Has that consultation ever taken place? I doubt it. So you need to do that, and you're in violation of your oaths of office and have not asked permission to hire anybody as required. Parents, you have alternative educational options that have been outlined this evening. You can pull your kids out of school. There's lots of uh, support for it. Uh, in fact, my daughter has done so, and the children couldn't be happier in learning a lot. <clears throat> in fact, uh, as a general aviation pilot, they're going to have an aviation day. I'll take them up in the plane myself, and they'll learn about all the wonderful things that relate to that. So why is alternative education, or, or rather normal education, uh, important? Because, unfortunately, the scores, as, as you have heard earlier, with regard to the performance in the county are terrible. In fact, they're abysmal. So as far as proficiency is concerned, um, elementary reading is 55%, middle school is 49%, high school math is uh, 52%, elementary math is 63%, middle school math 52%, high school math 47%, graduation rate is 75%, and college ready index, which I find interesting, is 32.8%, which is terrible. I mean, you can do better. Basically, the way I view it, you violated your contract with the community. You're not performing. And anybody that doesn't perform, like Donald Trump says, you're fired. Okay. <laughs> so parents, <coughs> excuse me, listen, uh, parents, regain your sovereignty. Go to the, uh, this following website. It's called Palm Beach County Jural Assembly.org. I'll spell out Jural, which means law. That's uh, Juliet Uniform Romeo Alpha Lima. Again, Palm Beach County Jural Assembly.org. And uh, you'll be able to take back control as the way it should be in this county. Thank you. I yield my time. Jason Mariner, Gail Byer, Nathaniel Galang. I think you had called Lorraine Abbey before. I called your name, speak. Go, go ahead and state, state your name. Yes. I'm Lorraine Abbey, uh, Lorraine Abbey Katsev. I'm a nurse nutritionist. Um, why are we following irrational authorities and destroying our lives? That's the subject of my naturalblaze.com article posted yesterday, October 19th, that I've sent as links to this board in two different emails which contain many other sources of evidence that masking healthy children is both pointless and dangerous. The independent real science is clear that healthy children are not dying from COVID and not COVID spreaders. The myth of asymptomatic spread has been completely debunked by quality science that our health agencies know full well, even though they continue their false guidance. As Dr. Mark McDonald stated in the unmaskyourchild.com info I've sent you, we've known for over a year that children are essentially unaffected in any meaningful way by this viral pandemic. And for that reason, there's no need to place any additional protective measures on them, such as mandatory or even optional mask wearing. Masks are causing real world physical and psychological harm. I gave this board info from attorney Aaron Seary, highlighting two studies showing there's no difference in viral load between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated, which means no difference in spreading the virus. 
Attorney Seary tells us these papers establish that CDC's justification for crushing civil and individual rights has disappeared since the basis for crushing these rights was the assumption that COVID-19 vaccines would prevent the spread of the virus. It doesn't. That renders the claim false. This board has the links to those studies in my provided emails. Countless folks have come here and presented this board with evidence that CDC and other public health authorities have been misguided and lying and are harming the public with their irresponsible recommendations. This board has given no indication it's exploring this passionately delivered information. It's time for this board to respond to the specifics that have been presented and I hereby petition discontinuing all mandates now and forthcoming for masks, vaccines, and so-called vaccine passports or deliver a point-by-point, study-by-study response to what we contend prove that these mandates are nonsense and non-science. Masking healthy children is dangerous child abuse. I feel it's criminal behavior. I note that under Florida statute, the crime of child abuse is a third degree felony. Given the reported harms, including teachers tyrannizing children and abusive and shaming behavior, uh, masking mandates must be discontinued. Jason Mariner, Gail Byer, Nathaniel Galang. I'm Jason Mariner, and I want to bring everyone here up to speed on a couple things. Governor DeSantis said no masks, no mask mandates. And like someone mentioned here, this is not a legislative body. This is a body that seeks to make our kids your kids. And that's not going to happen on my watch. There's a lot of parents here who see what's going on. They're our kids, not yours. We see what you're doing. You're seeking to divide our children. You want them to see color. Mr. Mariner, pull your mask up, please. I'm sorry. This mask is as useless as this board. There's no law for me to wear this mask. Just like there's no law Mr. Mariner, for you to teach on. our kids critical race theory. Officer, you don't. Oh, turn, off the mic- turn off the microphone, Mr. Mariner. Mr. You're out of here, Mr. Mariner. Gail Byer, Nathaniel Galang, Karen Holm. Hello. All right. So uh, first of all, before I begin, I think it's appropriate to ask... Your name, please. Oh, sorry. My bad. My name is Nathan Galang. Uh, I am a former student of the Palm Beach County School District. I'm a current college student. Um, First of all, I think it's important that we stop trying to pretend like we're in the Holocaust because we're not. Okay? So first of all, masks work. Uh, there's been a lot of research done. If you had 100 people and 80% of people were wearing masks, you would lower transmission significantly. If that was done on the grander scheme of things, 33,000 deaths could be avoided uh, according to research. Other research found that looking at a country, 198 countries uh, where cultural norms and government policies favored mask wearing, they had lower death rates. Okay? We can look specifically at these countries and compare them to our own. In America, as we know, we're approaching Vietnam more levels of death, okay? In other countries like Japan, like Taiwan, like Vietnam, where mask wearing is common, where their populations are also quite large, their numbers are significantly less. If we want to look at something like Florida, like South Korea's population, we can see that in Florida, we were the epicenter. We have overall 3 million cases, 58,000 deaths. Compare that to Korea, with 300,000 cases and only 2,000 deaths. Masks absolutely work without a question, without a doubt. Go try to blow a candle out with a mask. I'm very curious to see how that goes. Go try to pee your pants. The water's not going to come out, okay? So besides that, vaccines work 95% effective. Uh, Vaccines are not just about transmission, but the effects when you get COVID. And when they look at that, when they look at the chances of dying, when they look at the chances of hospitalization, you are safer if you are vaccinated. It's very unbelievably effective. And also when we talk, want to talk about legal precedent, it's been done before. 
if you got kids going to Palm Beach County School Board or school district, they have to get vaccines already, okay? And when we look at um, the idea of mandating masks, if you go into a, in a, in a school naked, you will be removed by security. And I'm for that 100%. So we already have legal precedent for enforcing clothing. So guess what? Masks can be part of that. Finally, when it comes to critical race theory, uh, critical race theory is not when white people are bad. That's not what it is. It's an academic idea. It's an academic way of analyzing laws and legislation, how it affects things in a racial context. If you don't understand that, then don't talk about it. Finally, you guys, well, not you guys, but you guys, pretend to care about mental health, and then you get up here and talk about how uh, trans people are invalid, and then you get up here and, and groan as they pass the uh, LGBTQ month. Take a look at the mirror if you care about mental health. Clowns. Go ahead, Ms. Holmes. State your name for the record, even though I know it. I'm Karen Holm from District 6. Tonight I'm here to publicly document that I have not received records that I requested from your public records department. The first record I made on June 14th is communications between Dr. Fenoy and Jay Bogus and or the Health Advisory Committee. I received one copy of a text message. I paid for 2.4 hours of time the department said that they needed to review 72 emails. To date, I have not received the 72 emails. The second request was made on, on June 23rd, and it's emails from medical professionals to Dr. Robinson that discuss COVID-19. I paid for 20 hours of time from the, and that the department said they needed to review 602 emails. On September 14th, I received about seven emails. To date, I have not received the remaining 595 emails that I paid for. The third request made on July 8th is communications between Dr. Fenoy and top staff members. I paid for 3.9 hours of time that they said they needed to review 117 emails. On September 27th, I received a notice from the coordinator that they would do their best to have the records ready by the end of that week. But to date, I have not received the 117 email records. The fourth request made on June 14th is for six videos of the Zoom meetings of the Council of Great City Schools or the minutes if the videos don't exist. While the records coordinator and the executive director of the Great City Schools have both stated that the videos don't exist, neither have confirmed whether meeting minutes exist from these public meetings. To date, I have not received confirmation that meeting minutes uh, do, ex do not exist, nor have I received any meeting minutes. The fifth group request made on June 14th is for five virtual meetings or recordings or meeting minutes of the School Health Advisory Council, which is called SHAC. Three times the coordinator provided me with videos to the Superintendent's Health Advisory Committee, or the HAC. HAC is not SHAC. The difference was made clear in June. To date, I have not received any videos or meeting minutes from the SHAC Committee. The sixth request made on September 3rd is for all grant applications that the district submitted for emergency relief funding in the last three years. I was provided several documents that are notices of grants that were approved, but only a few grant applications. To date, I have not received the all grant applications. For reference, Florida case law has established that the reasonable amount of time for records to be provided is the time for the custodian to retrieve the record and to delete the portions of the record that are exempt. The school district the public records department has no reasonable excuse to delay the provision of these records as they have done with me. Thank you for listening. I'm gonna call the next set of names. Jane Justice, Betty Ann Moret, Deborah Balta. Hello, this is Jane Justice. I have a feeling I, you know, we learned so much at the school board. I appreciate everybody who comes out in defense of the children. It's shameful what's going on here. First of all, the, the statistics of the learning levels is ridiculous. And I have a feeling I know why the levels are so low because you have them thinking about their genitals all the time. Mrs. Robinson, LG, you can celebrate LGBT month at your house, but not here. LGBT month is for gay bars. It's not for the school. That's bullshit. And you and I and somebody on the and somebody at the phone said today we don't have CRT. What bullshit? 
Mr. Chair, decorum, explicit, expletive, cut it. She's done. Next, next speaker, Jane Justice, Betty Ann Mort. Who just spoke, Jane Justice? Betty Ann Mort, Deborah Balta, Scott Hodenstein, Christine Scott. Go ahead, ma'am. State your name, please. Yes, good evening. My name is Deborah Balta. I'm originally from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I moved here seven years ago to escape from... You need to come closer to the microphone. Sure. Good evening. My name is Deborah Balta. I'm originally from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I moved here seven years ago to escape taxation, regulation, and government overreach. Two out of three isn't bad. In March of 2020, Dr. Fauci's initial take on masks was that they were only to be used by essential workers. Less than a month later, they were a fixture as it related to public health. It went on from one mask to two masks, and at one point I heard three, but I honestly don't know how true that is. On September 10th, 2021, the first district court of Florida ruled that masks were optional for students. Parents have the right as legal custodians to determine the day-to-day -day needs of their minor children, not the government. The only instance in which the government should intervene is when a child is in danger. The best interest of the child is a legal principle to limit the legal authority of parents with their children. This is an example under the UN Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Article 23, Section 2, and the Hague Convention on Protection of Children and Cooper Cooperation in Respect for Intercountry Adoption, Article 4, Section B. In reality, the only person or persons that can determine the best interests of a child is a child's parent. What the federal government, the NEA, and Medical American Federation of Teachers and school committees nationwide have been, in have been doing is engaging in is child abuse, neglect, and endangerment. According to the Florida statute 39.101 and 827.03, this is just to name a few. It has been the Palm Beach County Schools District intention to enforce mask mandates on minor children under the age of 18 without scientific just cause. It has nothing to do with public health. If, there was, if that were the case, they would be focusing on prevention, not the suspension for the greater good of the student body in which they oversee. The students opposed to masks are imposed, are imposed by bias and discrimination by being placed in segregated rooms from the rest of the student population. The main goal and focus of the Palm Beach School District should be to provide any and all education resources, promote and nurture the future of our youth, allowed our children to be free, independent thinkers invoking critical thinking, not to be confused with critical race theory. You, all of you, are participating in child abuse, neglect, and child endangerment as it pertains to the students of the Palm Beach School District. I hope that the metrics that come out soon favor the children. These mask mandates are not laws. You are using your power to legislate the powers with we the people. Ben Franklin said it best, a republic if you can keep it. Thank you. My name is Betty Ann Moret. I have two children in the Palm Beach County School District for now. I'm here to represent them, these children, these children behind me, and the hundreds of thousands of sad eyes that I look at every day on our city campuses. I have very little to say to you, except there are several key new legislators in Tallahassee, and I think I will let them do all the talking for me. Audie Moser, Abriana Johnson, Lesko Brandon, Let's go, Brandon. That's a good one. Yeah, you guys got me on that one. You guys got me on that one. Jeffrey Bongiorno and Laura Depp. Go ahead, sir. State your name, please. Good evening. I'm uh, Scott Hodenstein, the president of the Democratic Public Education Caucus of Florida. Uh, I reside in Hillsborough County, but I did grow up in Green Acres uh, before going to serve in the Navy for 24 years. And after my retirement, I became a civics teacher in Hillsborough County. Earlier today, I attended the State Board of Education meeting in Orlando. And I gave public comment on a revised rule con concerning civics education. 
I warned the state board against do as I say, not as I do, because the rule discussed some principles I feel have been neglected. For example, in paragraph two of the rule, it talks about helping families prepare students to be civically responsible. Being civically responsible means being a member of society and having obligations towards other people. In paragraph 2B of the rule, it talks about educating according to the best standards. Um, here are some of the best standards. Standard 1.4 talks about the social contract, how each of us gives up some of our individual rights to protect the collective rights. Standard 2.2 talks about the obligations of citizens, how we go to jury duty, how we respond uh, and, and serve in the military if called upon to defend our nation through the draft. Standard 2.4 talks about how the government can put limitations on individual rights, such as when we tell people to stop at stop signs. And standard 3.12 discusses the Florida Constitution and how it limits state government power in some cases, and in case of Article 9, Section 4B, gives local school boards power. Paragraph 3A2 of the rule discusses shared responsibilities and equality of all persons, which brings to mind our ESE students, not just here in Palm Beach County, but throughout the state, many of whom are medically fragile and rely on others to mitigate transmission of COVID. Paragraph 3D2 of the rule uses words like civic virtue, personal responsibility, civility. Uh, and paragraph three says we should teach respect for elected officials. Anyway, I say all that to say thank you for setting the example of civic action by using all mitigation measures against COVID so that we can keep students healthy and in school with their friends and their support systems. Thank you very much. Ready? Go ahead, ma'am. Um, hi, I'm Laura Deppi. I'm going to speak about my healthy children tonight. I'm going to speak to the diocese tonight. I thank our governor for addressing many of the issues that needed to be discussed in the Brevard County press conference earlier today. I started sitting in the district meetings last year regarding Palm Beach County COVID protocol, hoping that our carefully selected Catholic private school would have enough sense to respect bodily autonomy and not follow those that are breaking the law, according to the Florida State Department of Education. I was wrong. Many schools, including ours, followed this school board's lead. I was sick with disappointment and quite frankly shocked that our school disregarded constitutional law in week two this year and re-implemented the mask mandates the ultimate bait and switch so that parents did not have time to make the best decisions for their families. Concerned parents had been asking all summer. Blame COVID as you like, parents were asking and thinking ahead. We felt secure for the most part that choice would be honored. I'll mention that we have a very international family and are very aware of the risks on many continents. That first week of school, I sat with our principal and she basically explained the motto that all God's ch children are honored, but only with masks. I refused to have my children forced back into masking weekly for church so they would were to be segregated at that time and not allowed in church. Thankfully, they never had to endure this at six years old because I pulled them before the week of chapel began. Surely this was not in God's teachings. After nearly two years, many conditions are concerned from extended masking. This list seems to be as long as a CVS receipt and I won't list them all here for the sake of time. Interestingly enough, the pastor at the church was also the pastor moderator at the school, but unwilling to show moderation for those children who opted to breathe. I am still shocked that my children were thought to be better off segregated than to simply distance and participate. The data has simply never been there to allow segregation of children anywhere in the district. The legal opt out at our school was never fully honored. I let the school know we were done. Our trust was broken. And even on day two, I had to send a note to the teacher pushing masks that keep us safe, healthy, and protected, knowing full well that most of the classroom had chosen to opt out. A tremendous weight lifted for me when we made the decision to withdraw and honor our family's choice. 
After all, we had already had COVID, but no one wants to talk about natural immunity. The school was delighted to get rid of an outspoken mom and replace us, I'm sure, with another kid from New York or somewhere stricter than Florida. It's almost as if a big secret that these diocese schools are masked until conveniently tomorrow, while the superintendent still says he holds the mask cards. Anywhere but homeschool has been a fabulous gift in the right direction. The school year is normal outside of brick and mortar school. Lastly, the Hippocratic Oath. If you're familiar, it means do no harm. How dare you keep these children without a choice if you don't mask yourself? You are not in charge. I do not co-parent with the school board, government, criminals, pedophile, teachers. Time's up, ma'am. Go ahead, Hel sir. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Bongi Bongiorno, and I want to wish Mr. Barberi a happy belated Columbus Day. And I'm, I'm here to I'm here to educate the folks. I, I think that a lot of people are in denial about what's going on in America. We have a communist takeover, and you're not educating our children. You are re-educating them. And every parent should pull their student out of this school. The first thing, that's the first thing. The second thing, when I spoke last time, we talked about affidavits. and. Here, here is the affidavit, and I know that Barberi has a legal degree, a law degree, and I just wanted to point, point out one thing, because when you read it, you're going to think, oh, this, is, this guy's nuts. It states the Virginia State Constitution, which all state constitutions reciprocate based on the U.S. Constitution, Article 4, Section 2, Paragraph 1. So, Barberi... It's for real, it has teeth, you're an attorney, you're, this is not bar law, this is constitutional law. So this is going to be on a, on a website for all the parents to download, along with a, what's called a parent empowerment tool by FreedomWorks, and it has every kind of affidavit and FOIA request that they'll need to take care of business. But the first order of business is Get them out of this school. This will put a quick halt to your guy's career when 30, 40,000 students pull out. And on that, and on that, the website is V-O-T-E-B-O-N-G-I. That's votebongi.com forward slash Turn the microphone -E off. Turn the microphone off. That's the website. Turn the microphone off. You can't, you can't talk about your candidacy. You're, you're done. You're done. Officer, he's done. He's done. Yes, you did. He's, he's out. Officer. That lady's out too. Whoever's screaming that, get her out of here. She's removed too. If you're going to act like children, I'll clear the room. Quiet. If I called your name, come up to your microphone. Otherwise, we're done with the public speakers. That lady's out. Officer, she's out. The lady with the camera right there. Remove her, please. I want them out first. Just give me a minute. Officer, get her out of here, please. That'll take us to board discussion items. Mrs. Andrews. 
Did I call your name? All right, if I called your name, come up to the microphone. All right, I'll go over the names of the people I called earlier. I got your name on the list. I can go? Go ahead, ma'am. Okay. Hi, I'm Aubriana Johnson. So um, if a kid did not wear a mask, they would be separated from the class and put into a separate room. How would you feel if you were put into a separate room? The same thing here. This cam that camera that's in that other room, it's facing a wall because they're scared. They're scared that people are going to come on our side, just for you guys to know. So, um, yeah, uh, we're not cowards. We are here to speak about what we want to. And you guys clearly don't care about it, because why would you guys? It's not like you ever did. Um, um, they don't want you to see the number of people in that other room. Um, as a kid, you would uh, you'd put up, well, sorry, uh, should be, you guys should be listening to me, because Thank you over there for listening. I'm very pleased to see that. Uh, you guys should be listening because you need to show that you have respect and care about kids, which you guys haven't been showing lately if you're putting masks on kids. Uh, kids should be taught real history. We are not your slaves. We do not, you do not have the authority over me or any other kid, kids. Neither do you have the authority to make these phony laws. You all have been, you all have broken laws, and you cannot hide that. You do your job. We'll do ours. But your job is not to make rules over rules. We do not have to wear a mask. Governor DeSantis, D Governor DeSantis said, that we do not have to wear them. It is not a law, neither is it a law for a kid, if they're sick, to stay quarantined. The kids near them have to be, stay quarantined too? What the heck? Like, come on. That's not a law. Um, but what do you say? You have to wear a mask. If, kids, if the kid's sick, they stay qu quarantined and the kid's near them too. How does that make sense? The kid had a mask on. Aren't the kids six feet apart when the kids aren't at lunch? When the kids are at lunch, they eat with a mask off. So what is there? Is, is there a bubble around them? No, there's not. A virus cannot live in temperatures over 80 degrees. I'm going to say this one more time so you guys can listen. Um, a virus cannot live in temperatures over 80 degrees. Time's up, ma'am. Shame on all of you. Michael, was that your name? Yes, sir. Come on up to the microphone, please. I feel pretty good. I'm trying to get out there. I thought I was going to get skipped. So. State your first and last name for the record, please. Yeah, Michael LeFaber. Go ahead. Uh, you know, we're here again. Uh, I feel like some of this has only gotten worse. Got the Education Secretary Michael Cordona who testified in the Senate that parents should not be the primary stakeholder in their own children's education. National School Board Associations wrote, <laughs> wrote a letter to Biden seeking federal protection from the FBI and Secret Service against parents who are angry about CRT and mass mandates in the classroom. You guys pretty much know what it said. They called us terrorists. Do you hear that? You're trying to paint us as terrorists after what you're trying to do to our kids in our country? Shameful. But isn't that just the way you are? <laughs> they poke the sleeping bear, then they realize that there's no safe places in life to run to, so they run to the police, the same police they try to defund. Boy, I bet you're glad you didn't pull that off, aren't you? But you know, if the school boards are really that scared of angry parents, I have a much more powerful option for you to exercise. It's called leave a damn kids alone. 
period. We don't want you messing with our kids. Praising, uh, paraphrasing Will Smith here, don't want nothing, don't start nothing, won't be nothing. What did you think the reaction would be when you decided to come after our children? And who do you think gave you the right to our children anyway? Look, no one here came here to do any harm to anybody. No one. But you did start something. And you have no business trying to steal our kids from us. You have an agenda. You have no right to terrorize our kids either. You have a problem. And I've not heard one violent threat towards any one of you up there or any school board member, period. But your insecurities shine bright when you cower in fear because you must now face the very bear you poke. So here we are, the bear you poke. Do we look intimidated? Does it look like we want anything to do with your agenda? Does it feel like you're winning? Because I don't see a single person here that came here to back you up. Think you would have that. You see, you have nothing to fear except fear itself. And you are scared only because you know you are wrong, not because of any threats. You're afraid because we are standing up to you in massive numbers all across the country. And so what if we're angry? You chose to mess with the greatest gift God gave us, our children. So you're going to have to deal with it. Or like I just said, leave our kids alone. You see, freedom scares you because there's no power in it for you. But there is power and freedom for our children. And that is exactly what I will deliver to them. Put that on CNN. Is there anybody else there that is on the list that hasn't spoken? Come up to the podium, ma'am, and state your name. Hello, my name is Idy Moser. Um, I have spoken here before. Uh, I am the mother of that amazing grandchild that just spoke. Um, very passionate about freedom and her love, and also the mother of Angelique Contreras, which I'm sure you all know her as well. And all I have to say to you all, because you've heard so much all day today, is take a deep breath and remember when you were young, because obviously I think all of you have forgotten what it was when we were born, and we, and we had a life, and when we went to school, and when we fought under trees and had, you know, little issues with our friends and we drank out of water hoses and we ate dirt and we lived our life. And I knew last year when you all or the, the city of Palm Beach decided to close down the beaches that what all was happening in this world had nothing to do with the virus but with control. And for some reason, the school boards have decided to continue that control, even though DeSantis has said, hey, the virus hasn't done any better with or without masks. I mean, there's 57 counties in Florida without mask mandates, and their rates of infection are no different than Palm Beach County that are all making these kids wear masks, because you wear a mask, it supposedly helps me, I wear a mask, it supposedly helps you. You get vaccinated, it supposedly helps me. I get vaccinated, it supposedly helps you. Like, is there any critical thinking left? Like, do you not laugh inside when you hear nonsense like that? Like, when you go to grocery stores and Walgreens and you hear these recorded messages that people from communistic countries are used to hearing on loudspeakers every single day, the same thing over and over again? Don't you laugh when you see people in a car driving with a mask and gloves and riding their bicycles outside by themselves with a mask? I mean, these things, like after 30 minutes of breathing in it and saliva in it, it's null and void. Like, it's contaminated. And you're making kids wear this. Like, you all here probably are all vaccinated, and you look like a bunch of I don't even want to say the word because you'll turn the mic off, but you can figure out the word I want to use. And you're vaccinated and you're wearing masks and you're social distancing and you're still wanting people to wear masks. Like, I'm six feet away from everybody. Who cares if I have a mask or not? The virus doesn't float in the air and, you know, capture you because you're sitting on your chair or your high horse. It doesn't happen that way. Like, you walk through a restaurant and the virus is going to catch you, but when you sit down, it stops. I mean... Think of how ridiculous you guys have been and how ridiculous you're teaching kids like the guy that spoke earlier. He is totally brainwashed. 
All right, we're done with the public speakers. BD1, Mrs. Andrews. Thank you. My discussion item says severing uh, membership with the Florida School Boards Association. And I have prepared some comments for my fellow board members that I'd like to read. As you know from my email last week, I resigned from po the positions of Florida School Boards Association Equity Committee Chairperson and from the Board of Directors representing the School District of Palm Beach County. I cannot in good conscience remain with an organization that tolerates discrimination, hate speech, or bigotry at the very helm. The president of any organization sets the tone for the organization. The president can choose to willfully support initiatives or can reject them. The Florida School Boards Association president has damaged the organization by making racist remarks about LGBTQ plus students and Guatemalan students. You probably have seen by now the articles in the newspaper, the videotaped remarks in her own words about our students. I did pass out a letter tonight that you can read from Lee County School Board about just some of those remarks that was made by the FSBA president. It is clear the FSBA president has issues serving all students. I must speak out against hate speech of all forms. Therefore, my work cannot continue within the organization. As I said, the FSBA president needs to step down from the top leadership position. Many others support this position, including the Guatemalan Maya Center of Palm Beach County. We must foster an inclusive educational environment where Guatemalan, Maya, LGBT, plus, and all students are treated with dignity and respect. I choose to advance my goals with other local, state, and national organizations. It's always a pleasure to do the work within my own school district, the Palm Beach County School District. It is futile to remain with FSBA with open bigotry at the helm. We have come too far to close our eyes and pretend it's okay. I will continue to stand up and speak out against hate speech for all of our students and pray that you will do the same. Therefore, I sever my affiliation with the Florida School Boards Association. And I'd like to open up the discussion now about which direction my fellow board members would like to take. Thank you. Ms. Ayala, then Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to thank my colleague for bringing up this conversation because this topic is particularly personal to me for various reasons, and I think it's critical that we make the right decision here. I think it's no secret that school boards across this state and around the country have faced unprecedented challenges while trying to do our jobs and make decisions that are student-focused. For nearly a year, school board members, and at times even their families, have been threatened and unfairly targeted. To that end, I reached out to our school boards association to share my experiences and my thoughts. In my case, I can share that I have received expletive-laced, sexually explicit, physically threatening messages, and I have received anonymous mail at my home with Nazi symbolism, which has become, I guess, a distasteful and hateful trend picked up by some members of the public who believe that Holocaust comparisons are appropriately made in this instance. It is wrong, and it is careless. My colleagues on this board have been verbally attacked while out and about with their families, with their children, and with their spouses, and some of our colleagues around the state have unfortunately had it much worse. None of this has been about limiting public comment. We have heard lots of public comment tonight. We want to hear from parents and stakeholders. This is not about a refusal of your right to address us as a board. This is about safety, something which we are all entitled to, and this is about our ability to do the business of this district that we were elected to do, something that teachers, parents, and most importantly, students deserve. A part of NSBA's letter that no speaker here tonight seemed to reference or notice reads as such. Local school board members want to hear from their communities on important issues and that must be at the forefront of good school board governance and promotion of free speech. However, there also must be safeguards in place to protect public schools and dedicated education leaders as they do their jobs. 
NSBA believes public discussions and transparency by local school board members are important for the safe and effective operations of schools. It is vital that public discourses be encouraged in a safe and open environment in which varying viewpoints can be offered in a peaceful manner. Our children are watching the examples of the current debates and we must encourage a positive dialogue even with different opinions. So in all of this, I can say that the support I expected from our statewide school boards association was simply not there. No tangible or long-term solutions were provided. And then when support came through from other means, such as from NSBA, from our US Department of Education and our Secretary Miguel Cardona, from the Department of Justice, and many of us finally felt relief for the first time in a year, FSBA did not support those statements and the intention behind them, which was to simply protect the safety of public servants and their families while we do our best to do our jobs and provide a good education for every child. Additionally, as my colleague mentioned, the organization has allowed someone to continue serving as president who has made racially disparaging comments towards the Hispanic Latin community targeting Guatemalan students and offensive comments towards LGBTQ plus students. That is completely unacceptable to me. Furthermore, we were not notified in a timely manner as dues paying members that this had occurred and what they were gonna do about it. There were opportunities to appropriately handle these situations to communicate with us as partners and educational leaders and they were not taken. I cannot in good conscience be affiliated with this organization when decisions and comments are made in this manner and I fully support my colleague's recommendation and I will be revoking my membership as an individual from the organization. Ms. Whitfield. Thank you so much. Um, I really wanna give a little context around this for people in the audience and everybody who's had an opportunity to, to hear about what's going on at FSBA, the Florida School Boards Association and in Lee County. Um, a few weeks ago, I received a call from the Guatemala Maya Center. Um, I very much care about this, this community. They are my community. I live in Lake Worth Beach and uh, I feel like they're my neighbors. So talking to them, um, I heard that they had heard these comments um, from the FSBA president that were disparaging the Guatemalan families. Um, this is particularly upsetting because they asked me, is this you? Are you the school boards association? And I said, no, my goodness, this is not us at all. So then I took the opportunity to take it, to write a letter to my, and an email to my fellow colleagues and to the Guatemala Maya Association and to Chris Patricia, the president of the Florida School Boards Association to let them know that we did not stand by these comments. We were not part of this, um, that I, I fully disavowed these comments. Um, and I had the opportunity to talk to Ms. Patricia. Patricia. And when I spoke to her, um, you know, she had expressed some regret um, and wanted to come see the Guatemala Maya Center. And they were so generous to give that opportunity for them to come. Um, however, uh, after we went through that situation, I found out that she had also um, disparaged LGBTQ students and had made some very hurtful comments that I watched myself um, about transgender students, which as many of you know, is a, is a really soft spot for me in my heart. So um, we then decided that I was not going to be meeting with her if she came here. I spoke to the Guatemala Maya Center again and let them know about this, shared the videos with them. And then as an independent organization, they decided that they did not want to see her at their property. They didn't want to spend time with her. And they also asked for her resignation. I want to share with you how much I respect them deciding this because really they were coming from a place of being very hurt by this woman's comments. Um, the things that they said did not represent the families that I know. Um, and just to hurt children and not understand them like that is completely against everything that we stand for here at the school board. So Anyway, through, due to all this, I agree with my colleagues. Um, I would like to resign. And also I would like Mr. Burke to reach out to the Florida School Boards Association and see if we can get some of our money back because it is a very, very large sum that we pay to be a part of this organization. And there needs to be some sort of, of penalty for them you know, taking this money and then not representing our communities. So um, it was $25,000 we paid in May. Um, I hope that we will receive some of that funding back. And in addition, I hope that the Florida School Boards Association will see that we're serious, that we don't 
agree with this stance and that Ms. Patrika can, can resign and hopefully go forward with representing the, all the families in our community and all of our children who all deserve the best representat representation that we can get them. Thank you. Vice Chairwoman Brew. Thank you. So I'm not going to rehash um, what occurred. I will say that I support my colleagues in their positions. Um, however, I don't believe that, first of all, we can't vote. This is a, this is a workshop. So I would ask, since it's very clear that the three of you would agree, but we can nod our heads in agreement, ask Mr. Burke to bring back an agenda item for us to withdraw from the FSBA. That's my first request. I also want to bring up to you, and I know, Ms. Aiello, you weren't here at the time, but I had often in the past before COVID suggested that we work with Miami-Dade and Broward because we, the three of our districts are the most similar. And we did have, I believe, one or two tri-county meetings. I think that we should be able to do that, especially through a virtual format. But we share a lot of the same concerns. We share very similar populations. Um, and I do think that we can work together with our legislative priorities. So I would like to see us have a, a deeper discussion or see if all of you agree that we should, again, reach out to Miami-Dade and Broward see how we can work together on our similar issues, and again, see that we agree that Mr. Burke should bring back an agenda item to us at the next meeting. So let's do one, of the, one, one at a time. <clears throat> do we have a consensus on putting the item on the agenda for withdrawal of the school board from the FSBA? Let me see a show of hands, please. Okay. So we have consensus to do that, so we will put that on an agenda that's uh, for the meeting after the week after next, Mr. Burke? November 3rd. November 3rd. This is Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> so when I first saw um, Mrs. Andrews' impassioned letter, um, as a person who has, seems like I've spent a lifetime fighting whichever it, ism it is, in institutions, including the Palm Beach County School District. Um, I thought that we should stand in the paint and fight to change the organization. But I have to say this, I, I participated in FSBA some years ago and was bitterly disappointed. And I have not participated since, but I thought because time and time again, I hear my fellow board members are going to FSBA that there was some true value in the organization in terms of leading change on behalf of students. And so um, it has become my impression over the past several days, uh, and primarily from talking to other school board members around the state, that, um, that maybe the FSBA, it was described more as networking than fighting for change. And so um, I don't particularly have any objection to no longer being part of FSBA um, because, I mean, as I said, I was disappointed in them many years ago, um, and which is why I haven't participated, but I thought that they were providing more value um, in terms of advocacy for students than, um, than what I've recently learned. So, but I also don't think it's appropriate to raise our hands right now. So, let me let me ask the board members. We're putting this on the agenda. If we, there's no sense in discussing any further tonight, we have another agenda item. I also we have uh, not seven recorded non uh, non agenda speakers we have to listen to. So, if you would just hold your comments until the, we put this on the agenda. If, any objection to that? I mean, if somebody feels it's very important they speak tonight, fine, but. <clears throat> All right. The other <clears throat> issue that you brought up, Ms. Bro, was stated again, please. It's just, um, and we can bring this up at the next meeting, but the discussion was to start um, reaching out to Broward and Miami-Dade and see if we could reactivate a tri-county group um, to where we can sit and brainstorm and work together on the issues that we share. All right, um, 
the next agenda item, um, Dr. Robinson, BD2. Thank you. Um, in a recent community meeting, um, one of the participants uh, made a statement about uh, what are we doing to address mental health? And when, when she asked a question, are we teaching students coping skills and where to turn for help? I could not definitively provide the answer. And so as I, um, I thought about it, I want to bring this forward to request a workshop on our layers of mental health support and education. I think the item got a little bit twisted here, but um, just so that I'm clear and that we're all clear about the layers of support, the behavioral health professionals, the co-located services and so forth, and how they're being used and what room for improvement there is. And in addition to that, because we've realized that there's a shortage of um, these mental health professionals, um, the status of a uh, choice program that would prepare young people to enter you know, to enter college and then become such professionals in the future. So it's really a request for a workshop. Mrs. Whitfield. I know this isn't how we normally do this, but um, I would love if we could hear from one of the people who actually does this job on what it's like to be on the ground every day doing this. Um, I, I just think it's so valuable. It's a, it's a new position that we created just a few years ago. Um, the work that's being done is crucial. And to have somebody come in and say, this is what a day in the life of one of these mental health professionals in our school is like, I, I would love that. If that could be part of the workshop, um, maybe even a couple of people from different levels of schools so they can explain to us when a high school student's in crisis, how they help when an elementary school student has a you know, trauma in the family, how do they help? I would, I would love to hear that. I think that would be very valuable. Mrs. Andrews. Thank you, Dr. Robinson, and I think it's truly needed. Um, as I've seen you at the Council of Great City Schools as we're having the conference right now, there's quite a bit on that agenda. Keith Oswald, I saw you on that meeting, and I know Mr. Burke is facilitating tomorrow along with myself. If you can kind of click in, because you know we are members of the Council of Great City Schools, quite a bit of information, uh, sessions on the mental health uh, uh, related issues. So uh, I think we are ready for a workshop here, but I think we can get something uh, within the next few days on some of those topics that are being discussed at the national level. Dr. Robinson. Um, thank you, and I also, as part of the, the workshop, want to um, include uh, the case managers that we have and that address our more um, intense students. Um, so it's not, I, I don't want to just do the regular schools, but the support staff and our alternative schools too, to hear, you know, if we're going to bring people in to hear that end of the spectrum. All right, to the board, and we have a consensus on a workshop and bring in Mrs. Whitfield's uh, issue also, yes? So, Mr. Superintendent, would you try and schedule that for us when the, when yes, the sir. calendar allows it? Right. Would IT play the last seven non-agenda speakers that are recorded? Good evening, um, Superintendent and school board members and other stakeholders in Palm Beach County. Um, my name is Carl Mohammed, a non-agenda speaker, and I was calling in reference to the Ados community, the America Descendants of Slaves. And as we look at the um, trouble that the schools across the uh, state have been in as it relates to mask and no mask and all of the other things that are associated with the pandemic. Uh, we're still praying for your success and we do understand that you have been leaders inside of the, these kind of efforts inside of the state of Florida. But we want to, uh, from the ADOS community, we want to look at the idea of we have had no real academic deliverables delivered to us and we were in a trouble. Uh, position before the pandemic, and we're still uh, kind of somewhat in that same kind of uh, reality. And we were trying to build capacity inside of the community by coming to the school district to try to partner with you so that we could have all hands on deck and we could really move the bottom part of your, um, your system um, to a better position, and that is to help our children get out of the position that they've been in. And we need as much transparency as we can possibly achieve because we need everybody to see 
the era that we're in and, and how we possibly might be able to correct some of the things that we can do here in Palm Beach and we can help other uh, educational institutions around the country. And the community piece that we've offered, um, we've been trying to partner with your equity and wellness department, but if that's not going to be successful, we would wish that you would give us some kind of guidance, those who are in authority uh, in the direction that we need to go so that we can all uh, move all the children forward. And we know, once again, that the African-American children, the children, the Ados children, they have been the children on the bottom as it relates to academic uh, deliverables. And once again, we as a community, we're here now trying to assist you. We just wish that we could have the kind of necessary conversations that we need in order for us to move forward. Looking forward to uh, working with you guys and I hope each one of you have a blessed day. Thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Kelly Meesey, and I'm going to keep this short and sweet. Um, it is under the state law that parents and children have a choice to mask their children, and enough is enough. Children need to have the option of being masked or not. So I'm calling on behalf of Fiona Lachelle, who is one of the most bravest and courageous eight-year-olds I have heard of in these times. We need to be better for our children. Give the parents and children the option to wear masks. Make it optional. Thank you. Yes, hello, my name is Ryan Sullivan. I'm leaving a message for a non-agenda item. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, speak about the uh, school masks uh, mandate. I think it's time to end um, any type of masking mandate in our uh, county schools. Uh, unfortunately, I do not believe the uh, science backs any of this up. I believe decisions are being made um, based on God only knows what. So um, I'm asking on behalf of all of our children and our community to please make masks optional, not uh, mandatory. Again, I'm requesting that masks be made optional, not mandatory. I would like to say that again. I would like to have masks be made optional for our children to wear in school, not mandatory. Thank you. My name is Paula Shaw and I'm speaking on a non-agenda item regarding mental health and mask mandates. Because we have a worldwide mental health crisis um, and as a licensed psychologist, I've sadly seen triple the number of clients in my office in an average year, primarily in our youth. Depression and anxiety and suicide attempts have skyrocketed and the school mask mandate doesn't allow licensed mental health professionals to exempt students who are suffering with clinical levels of anxiety, depression, and trauma from mask wearing. And this is wrong as deep breathing exercises are a fundamental uh, way to cope with all levels of stress and it's rooted in evidence-based practices. And this can't be performed while masked and there's no better alternative um, to reduce these levels of anxiety and panic. A study directly from the CDC website reveals that children aged 12 to 17 have experienced significant increases in suicide attempts at a 22.3% higher rate during the summer of 2020 and a 31 or 39.1% higher rate during the winter of 2021 during the corresponding period in 2019. So think about that. There's almost a 40% increase in child suicide attempts this year compared to in 2019. I'm not against mask wearing, but it has to be effective and the benefits must outweigh the risks. And we can't prove that mask mandates have been effective, nor can we prove that there's no harm being done to our children by masking them for six to seven hours straight. Countless studies have proven cloth and surgical masks do not protect against viruses. Masking individuals weakens their autonomy. It exacerbates symptoms of anxiety and depression, hopelessness and trauma. Mental health professionals are witnessing this in their offices and parents are seeing this in their children. So now Florida has one of the lowest infection rates. Palm Beach County was just 4.1% as of last week and Friday we're going to see new numbers that show even lower new cases, which is great. And children have never been at risk of this virus and now there's so many therapeutic options available 
that the real crisis here is mental health in our children. So I ask that you please drop the mandate or add a mental health option to opt out. Thank you. Greg Tammy, father of two children in District 3, non-agenda item. You remember, remember me from a previous meeting when I advised you to avoid the liabilities of practicing politics with our children and practicing medical advice without your, with medical advice with your decisions. In no way is the following legal advice or an accusation from me. It is my opinion that every member of this board and the acting superintendent by medically mandating our children to wear masks, each of them may be violating Florida law, section 465.065, 2ND. By mandating masks, you may be practicing health care without a license. This includes providing, attempting to provide or offering medical advice and services, and this is at least a third degree felony for which you may face a maximum of five years in prison and a $5,000 fine. If any serious bodily injury should occur because of these decisions to medically mandate a mask, it may become a second-degree felony and includes a $15,000 fine. Not only may your decisions violate Florida law, I mentioned the shades of the Nuremberg Code, and I stated I wanted to help you. With your decisions to medically mandate masks, be warned by our children, you may be violating the Nuremberg Code. In the past, you should look at this up by authority of the Nuremberg Code on medical experimentation. It is my non-legally binding opinion that your decisions to medically experiment on our children to mandate them to wear masks based on flip-flopping medical advice from outside sources. You may also be violating the Nuremberg Code. Please understand the United States government has prosecuted, convicted, and executed medical doctors who have violated the Nuremberg Code for medical experimentation aiders and abettors. In this case, this may be each one of you. Aiders and abettors of Nuremberg crimes are equally guilty and have been prosecuted, convicted, and executed for medical experimentation. With your disregard of informed consent and by practicing medical experimentation, not only may you be guilty of felony level charges by violating Florida law, you may be violating the Nuremberg Code for medically experimentation on our children. As I expressed in our last meeting, I am here to offer you my opinion-based advice. I am trying to help, so listen up. Because you are misinformed by outside flip-flopping medical advice, you would like to reverse your decisions to medically mandate and experiment on our children by deciding to mandate our children to wear masks medically. For you are not licensed medical professionals, then I would have resigned shortly after, for you are treading in legal waters that are way deeper than you'll ever know. And you Hi, my name is Kelly Hudson. I'm speaking on a non-agenda topic, and I just want to know what in the world are you all doing? You've gone completely rogue and engaging in illegal behaviors and using our kids as a pawn to get paid to mask and eventually jab our kids. You're receiving money to break the law and the mask and the eventual jab against our kids' wills, and what is your end game? We just all want to know, like, what, what, what is the end game? I don't think you understand the abuse, the child abuse that is happening in the schools over these masks. We are at day 238 of masking children against their will and that of their parents. You are breaking the law for the parents' bill of rights and the EO that designates parents need to have the option, yet you expect our kids to follow your legal requirements. You are supposed to protect our children, but you are forcing medical devices on our children against their will and that of their parents. You have lost all control. And in May, you said kids can't be disciplined for mask issues, but now it's even worse than you can ever imagine. When children ask for breathing breaks at school, they are denied access to fresh air and disciplined accordingly. They're asked to leave the room, they get referrals, they get lunch detention, and they're even getting in-school and out-of-school suspension just for lowering it below their nose. Our kids are being isolated and alone, and alone in rooms for hours, almost all day but with busy work that they haven't even been taught, and then they're expected to do the busy work. They, a kindergartner in Tall Beach County was suspended from school because she took a breathing break. Let me repeat, our children at school ask for breathing breaks, and they are denied, and then they get in trouble, big trouble. Good kids are getting mask referrals for the first time in their whole school career and getting school, in school and out of school suspension. They are hiding in dirty bathroom stalls just to get a breathing break. 
they use their bath to wipe their boogers after they sneeze, and they plaster that nasty bacteria-filled petri dish over their face for hours. They cannot learn like this. I cannot for the life of me imagine how you think it's okay to inhale air through a cloth soaked in sweat, mucus, and saliva is deemed healthy for children's growing body and lungs. They drop them on the dirty bathroom floor and then pick them up and put them back on their faces. The state of emergency is over in Palm Beach County, and Florida is ranked last for new cases. And our kids are living their life outside mask-free of school. They have sleepovers, play sports, go to the doctor's office, attend church, go to birthday parties, Target, Walmart, Urban Air, baseball games, haircuts, libraries, Publix. I can go on and on, all without a mask, but they can't sit at their desk in the same community without a mask on. It's glaringly obvious that we are in a safer place than we were since this all started. So it is a perfect what you are doing is clearly illegal. End this power trip so, and give our kids their childhoods back so they can try to recover from the emotional damage you have caused. My name is Angela Salvatore. I'm calling on a non-agenda item. I'm calling to let you know as yesterday, October 19th, the county commissioners of Palm Beach County ended the COVID crisis. So that means that it is time for the school board to act on their many broken promises of freeing our children from wearing their cloth over their mouths, which has zero efficacy for preventing the COVID. And this board knows it. On several occasions, you have been caught not wearing your mask. Back in Tampa in May or June, we had several board members at this conference taking pictures, receiving their trophies without a mask. Let's talk about also Superintendent Burke, who is at the Chamber of Commerce, who is asking for money, lawyers, and guns while not wearing a mask along with a couple of other school board members, and not one person, that huge audience, were wearing a mask. You, will, you also demanded that our children at that time to muzzle up. You proclaimed that the COVID numbers had spiked, but yet none of you are wearing a mask at this huge ceremony. And lastly, our queen who pronounced it is privileged for us peasants to come before you to speak for the rights and well-being of our children. Was that a very expensive gala, dancing with big smiles, that everyone could see and taking pictures with a crowd of people without wearing a mask. While our kids mandated to go to this homecoming with a diaper on their face, where was all of your face diapers when you were getting awards, threatening our community, and dancing the night away? This is disgusting. And on top of it, the person who you're holding the line for by keeping this bacteria-filled muzzle on our children's faces, President Biden, not wearing a mask in a restaurant where it is a law in the communist camp, New York City. I used to think we needed to give you data. We needed to give you information to help you understand that you were misled or uneducated on the mask and how to, it is harming our children. But you, with your actions, taught me that you are doing this knowing that it is wrong and it doesn't prevent any protection. Instead, you understand that it is actually harming our children psychologically, physically, and you don't care. You need to free our children now and stop the abuse. Lastly, if you think this mask mandate is going to lead to experimental shot mandate that is not FDA approved, if you even try this on our children, Southwest will look like chump change compared to this mass exodus that will happen in our public schools. The parents of Palm Beach County will not allow you to use our children as guinea pigs. We will form our own school system one that actually teaches our children the fundamentals of a real education, not some communist ideology, making our, making our children hate one another and, be, and hate in our country. We will take our funding and build a real school system. Unmask our kids. Board members, I don't have them, Carol. Board members, uh, the, the board clerk and the general counsel would like us to document more clearly that we want to have that workshop. So I need a motion and a second. Motion was made originally by, and we're not in a workshop, but they, they've indicated that we can vote on putting something on the agenda. We can't vote on the item itself. So who made the motion to start with? Uh, Ms. Brill, and it was seconded by Mrs. Whitfield. It was a discussion item, yes. 
you made a motion to bring it back as, as an agenda item. Yes, okay. So that's the motion to bring it back on November 4th uh, as, as an item we can vote on. So all in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Was there another one, Board Clerk? That's the, the next one is your workshop request. Oh, and the workshop request. So we need to the vote on Dr. Robinson's workshop request. Motion by, Ms. by Dr. Robinson, seconded by Ms. Whitfield, who also has something she wanted to add. Is there any discussion on that one? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. With that, the, this meeting is adjourned.